Focus on this arm. So I might have a Zunari. I'll use the red one for that. So leave an example of this out. I thought you said you brought some time. No, I didn't in the end. <laughs> I think oh I just forgot to put it in. in the it's all good. Door. It's alright, it doesn't matter. Well, oh. thing is, if we ever do another one, we can do it on the different styles. The trouble is, there's so many different styles of armor. Hey, Eddie, good to see you. This is, is my son, Jordan. Hey, Jordan. Hey, uh, Eddie, um, that pedestrian gate, is that open? It's open. Oh, yeah. you opened it? That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good, good. I was meant, uh, I meant to go out and do it. Um, okay. It's good that you did it. So, uh, so, I don't know if you saw the announcements. Are you aware of the announcements? Did you read, General? No? Are you just coming in to work? No, I'm coming in to have a look at your... Oh, okay, yeah. So you're here for the event? Hi. Okay, cool. Have you started? No, not yet. Um, but the stream has started, so... Uh, so we're live. So it's, it's currently looking at me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll bring down the stand. Uh, I have plenty of practice equipment so you can also follow along if you want to oh. learn how to do some moves. Mm -hmm. Jordan? So this is sort of like an impromptu martial arts class. So oh, you there you go. Join in. I think Jordan would be interested. Jordan? Yeah? Okay. If you're, inter if you're interested in that, I'll arm you. With me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Yeah, I can't do too much more because my hip. Uh, we can do basic stuff because I'm not doing flips. Wait, so uh. you're actually not? Yeah, we're live. Uh, Where? Uh, Reddit, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook. Do you want me to dress one of them up in advance? Do you want to come back in the van later? You would. Okay. Um, yeah, already on my end. Wicked, yeah? Wicked. Uh, I'm keeping the stream warm, so mm. just hosting it till you're ready to go. It's not like TV where you go on the second. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, we go. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I just got to just yeah. check up on Okay, you know, we have five people watching so far. Um, let's pop that over there for a second. Five people. Yeah, the only thing on this, bear in mind the weight of the arm, or it could break it just standing on it. Because you get a die. But I'll just on that and have an idea for the second idea. How long are you going to hang around for? Oh, I don't know. An hour? Oh, okay. If you wanted to wear armor. Sorry? Do you, you, you want to wear it? Do you want to like... Yeah! I'm going to show... Uh, I'm going to dress James up in it. Okay. So I can get you ready in advance and you can be right. wearing it ready to go. Nice ready and toasty warm. warm. Do you have a, a, do you have um, a kind of. as well? Not Why are you talking about you? So you're unjealous. <laughs> but uh, walk up, hey Endabuya, welcome to the stream. Uh, so as I said, um, special stream today. we we'll be... I've got my martial arts teacher in. Mike Graham. He runs the he runs my martial arts class, and that's the thing I'm doing instead of um, SCA training, training uh, samurai techniques, really. So this is what I've been doing on Wednesdays, where I should have been at SCA. So you'll get a glimpse into what I've been doing. Uh, hopefully, it's not too useless. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, all right. Cool. So we're, we're pretty much set up here. Um, I just, some people are getting dressed in funny pants. Others are just chilling out. Yep. <laughs> just chilling out. <laughs> All right. I'm um, putting on some, uh, 
Oh, some music here. Yeah, I just thought I'd go. Next time I have concentration. Uh, uh, in the brief, if you're here, um, it would really help me out if, um, if we do get that rush and sit you here, uh, it would help me out uh, if you answer common questions for me. Because if we do get that rush, I won't be able to get around to all of them. So that would really help me out if you could stay and do that. But no worries if you can't. Uh, are you, uh, do you want to go on? If you're ready to go. If well, you well, we'll just go. That's okay. fine. All right. Yeah, just, uh, all right, here you go. Hand it off to Mike Gray. Uh -huh. Maybe we'll just introduce you right here. So this is Mike. So this is Mike. He, Mike. he will be to, he'll be leading the class and explaining everything there is to know about how to wear armor, how to use it. No pressure then. Right. <laughs> nice to see everyone. It's great. Uh, I, I've been actually fascinated with Japanese history and especially the samurai, the armor, and uh, the shinobi as they were. Um, ninja is a very common word that is very misunderstood, I think, but uh, they were very much uh, part of the samurai culture, um, samurai class as well. And I was lucky enough to be studying in Japan, but uh, I've had a love of the armour for years. Um, in England, where I've come from originally, uh, we did a lot of work on uh, TV, movie shows, documentaries and things like that, and did rental of the armour, um, but I just love dressing up and fighting in it, so for the last sort of 40 odd years I've been studying not only just the, the wearing of it, uh, it's the fighting side as well. So uh, I thought today we'd have a look at a question that so many people ask me, um, is how do you actually wear the armour, but I, I've talked to you from a point of view is, if you're going to wear it, you're going to wear it for fighting. So um, there are certain ways and adjustments that you'd need to make to make it work. And uh, you know, from a soldier's point of view, what would it have been like back then and why did they wear it in a certain way from time to time? So hopefully I'll be able to give you some good um, demonstrations on that as well. Uh, and then equally, we'll also have a look at some of the main battlefield weapons as well. There's a lot of misunderstanding sometimes about what a samurai would have actually used on the battlefield, or how and why. Uh, in fact, the Japanese armour is quite unique in the world as well. So um, I'll uh, sort of hand over to the maestro here on the, the camera to uh, lead us over. Um, and introduce a young man over here called James who's going to join us and we're going to help get you dressed up in, in armour as well um, with my glamorous assistant Kay over here will be over in a second to, to help me out as well. So, um, James, we'll pop over here. So, you've never actually worn samurai armour before, I'm making an assumption. And don't worry guys, uh, your don't worry, um, just switch the camera here. Yep, good to go. Okay. So this will be the first time that you've, you've worn armour. Um, as such, it'll be quite nice. Interesting enough, a lot of people think initially it's quite heavy, but after you've worn it for 10 minutes or so, you suddenly forget you're wearing it, which is really quite interesting as well. Um, now, we've started the process slightly, and look, we've, we've got some uh, interesting outfits for you. The, uh, the samurai, depending on the, the clan and the, the, the rank that you would have, would wear different things. To be fair, if you're only just starting out for the very first time, uh, one of the questions that people ask me is, what should I wear underneath? To be fair, if you're a martial artist and you've got a normal martial art gi, just wear that, it's absolutely fine. The most important thing is flexibility to keep it moving. Um, you can get the full hakama, which is like a split dress that the samurai would wear. Um, that can be quite awkward because it's not tied at the bottom like here. Um, so in which case you'd have to tie the bottoms up. But what they'd often do is lift the whole skirt up and then tuck it in on the inside on itself, which gives a lot of freedom around the legs, especially in hot weather. Um, but in this case, this um, hakama comes in, it's very brightly coloured and it's got ties at the bottom around the shins already in place, so you just need to tie those up. Can the camera see this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You're in frame, it's, it's portrait, not widescreen. Yeah. Now, obviously, whatever you're comfortable in, and uh, Japan, the weather can be quite all over the place, even in summer. It can be very hot and steamy, uh, and there's lots of issues that come along with wearing armour. And traditionally, in the battlefield times, um, they would go on campaign, and they would wear the armour pretty much 24-7 for a period of two or three months sometimes, eating in it, marching in it. Uh, it got completely lice-infested, it fell apart. No armourers ever, ever came on campaign either. Um, so the samurai would either have to repair it themselves as they went on, um, or the most common practice was to steal armour from somebody else. Um, preferably the enemy, which was always a good thing, it was the plunder, but certainly they would rob each other big time. So the idea was on the battlefield, anything that was really big and flashy um, was not a good idea because everyone would be trying to steal it. You wanted it to look as basic and as horrible as possible, so no one wanted it, um, which is quite an interesting sort of soldier's point of view as well. Um, but whatever you're comfortable in, to be fair, um, the Japanese have this lovely sort of um, uh, underwear that they wear which is pretty much like a wrap around the middle um, and they sometimes just wear that alone in the hot weather. Um, but in this case, most of the time, a t-shirt um, and a loose pair of trousers is fine. Um, footwear, uh, this is very um, samurai um, 
uh, steel toe cap boots and whatever. Obviously, the Japanese in the armour, they didn't really worry too much about protecting the feet. Barefoot was very, very common. Tabai shoes were, were often worn, but that's just cloth. But the big one was um, the Waraji sandals, which were made from straw. You have to tie them onto your feet and your toes overhang the end. Um, but they're actually very comfortable, especially if it's getting into wet and muddy conditions. Uh, but they generally would last about a day uh, on the road. So generally, a samurai would have a belt and they'd wear this, a pair of sandals on the belt, a pair on their shoes, and then they'd take grass as they were marching and then actually make some as they were moving along. So when they move that pair down, the one that they made goes on the belt. So it was a constant recycling process of keeping their shoes alive. Can I ask why? Why didn't you just get some decent shoes? They didn't just never wore shoes, it was part of the culture. Um, interesting, I think it's a cultural thing. Uh, you know, Westerners, when they first came over in the 1500s, used to wear shoes and boots, and they found, thought they were torture instruments. Uh, the same thing is when they brought chairs off the ship. They asked a Japanese person to sit in a chair, because they obviously sit on the floor in Japan, uh, and they believed that they were instruments of torture. You put someone in a chair, so they were so uncomfortable that you would end up having to confess to get out of the torture. So it's really interesting how people just have a completely different uh, view of, of the time of society as well. But basically what we'll say is you're ready to start dressing up. Now obviously, history of the armour, um, you can't just pin it down to one little section. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk very much from a layman's terms and keep it as much in English content as I can uh, for today. But um, the original armour was meant for horseback and it was great big armour. In fact it was called Oyuroi, which means big armour. Um, it was very heavy, it he weighted very heavily on the shoulders and it was a box armour and you sat down on a horse and pretty much you stayed there. Um, but as um, things changed, um, we found that the horses quite often became a lot less relied on, there was a lot more moving around on foot, it just wasn't suitable. So as always the Japanese adapting to their times, changed the armour, took the good ideas into the future, redefined it and they moved on. And what we saw from the great big arm shield so days and the great big helmets and uh, uh, Shiroko coming off of the side and all that kind of stuff which were perfect against arrows but then we saw a change in technology and then firearms came in and they had to start changing everything. So hopefully as we start dressing you I'll talk you through some of the different uh, side of things as well. Now um, whenever we're getting dressed we're going to start off with uh, the feet and then we work our way upwards. Uh, if you were a very rich uh, samurai, you'd have some retainers with you. Um, they wouldn't be women, unfortunately, but uh, at home in the castle, they certainly would have had their concubines dressing them. But out on the field, they would have had some servants who would help them dress in the armour. If you were less um, sort of high-ranked and didn't have a lot of money, you would often dress yourselves, but quite often you'd have a buddy and you'd sort of dress each other as well. But they got very good at being able to slide in and out of armour um, and hang it from the trees and slide out from underneath and then slide back up into the morning. Um, quite often overnight the armour would be hung over a fire because all the smoke would come up and get rid of all the lights that were in it during the course of the day. So you can imagine how rugged this, this looked in the end. Um, and obviously once we're dressed up we'll, we'll talk through why the armour is very different than the rest of the world as well. So if we're going to start at the bottom, we'll assume at the moment we'll let your, your boots stay on. They won't be an authentic boot, um, but quite often they would be, uh, yeah, as I said, the, um, the Waraji sandals, the straw sandals. Um, but the first area that we're going to look at now is the Sune Arte. Now these are basically just calf protectors. Your feet won't be protected at all, but this was designed to strike, um, stop low um, strikes down. Now these are authentic copies. I uh, was a, a distributor for Iron Mountain Armoury uh, Armour and was happy to go in their early days. So we, uh, we looked at lots of different designs on this. And from a practical point of view of fighting, I've got my favourite styles. Now, um, one of the styles that you'll often see, and I'll grab this from over here, I'm assuming they are they? Um, this is quite a solid plate. Um, it's got knee protection on the top and it's a solid plate all the down. And the larger part is meant to go on the outside. And although it's not on my knee, when my knee comes up like that, it actually covers my knee perfectly. So this was really meant for horseback. So if you're on a horse, this is actually looks really good. And I was really um, attracted to these when I first started. But because I do a lot of fighting on the ground, I found out there's a lot of problems with it for me. Um, in one, it's kind of a one size fits all. So you have to bend them to size a little bit. And if you've got bigger shins or bigger calves than somebody else, they're very hard to actually get a really good fit. The other problem that you have is they're quite weighty. So it tends to drop down a little bit and you find that the little sharp points start digging into your uh, ankles. That can be very painful. But most importantly, um, when you go down to your knee, it looks like that might be comfortable, it really isn't. Getting down on your knees, getting down onto groundwork and ground fighting, 
these get in the way and they actually cause you quite a lot of bruising sometimes. I think they look good and when you're displaying your armour and putting them by the box they look amazing. Uh, I'm not saying they're, they're an absolute terrible design, it was an original design, but they need to be made to fit. But if you're going to be uh, training in it and fighting in it, I would suggest this is not the best way to go. You can always get um, a, a lighter scale. And these were called heavy Sunei Artes. There's a variation where you'd have a cloth top, but still the, the solid bottom. That's like a medium um, session. But my favorite ones are basically um, spines that run down. Now, it doesn't look like there's a hell of a lot of protection on here, but it's amazing how well they will protect the ankle as well. What covers your knee, um, although this is cloth, we've got lots of steel, um, hexagons in here that have been sewn in. So that's solid steel all the way through, but it's very, very flexible to protect the knee. And as we're looking across, you've got two ties and a piece of leather which is on the inside. Now that leather is meant to go on the inside of the ankle. Um, the main reason is one, it stops you from rubbing against your own feet, but if you are on horseback, what happens is this actually protects the horse and it's not getting hurt by having metal running across its flanks as well. So that's a very fine soft hide there um, to protect the horse, but when you're wearing it, it does make a big difference. But for me, the big difference is wearing it, it is so comfortable. It doesn't matter the shape of your leg, the size of your shin or a calf or anything like that, it is an absolute amazing, comfortable um, thing to wear. Hey, maybe I could um, ask for give me a help on this one. Now when we're wearing it, it's quite literally, um, you can sit down and it's one you can put on yourself. You want to wear it so that the kneecap is roughly about here. And a lot of people think that should cover the kneecap, but it doesn't. It needs to drop down because when you're bending your knee, it will move into shape around it as well. And it's quite literally, we just bring it around on the sides and we start off by going slightly tighter and you think you're going to lose the circulation to your toes in a minute, but it will loosen off very quick once you start moving. Japanese are not great at knots necessarily um, for tying things they like to wrap. Um, however, a simple bow at this stage is fine. Um, if I was going to be fighting in it for any time, a bow wouldn't work because it will loosen off. In which case, I just do a knot around the side here. And as I come around, I just do a double knot, keeping the knots towards the back. Um, so, uh, Reddit, the front. so Reddit asks, will I get arrested for carrying the, specifically the red shin guard? No, no, these are just normal clothing. If, uh, if you're, I'm playing football on a Saturday afternoon, I might have shin guards that I'm wearing to the game. There's no difference to those according to the law. So, uh, but that's actually a very interesting question as well. But um, if you look at the, to, the technology of what these actually are, they still exist today in hockey, in football, and any kind of shin guards that you have in cricket. They're all designed from armour battlefield oh, stuff to protect you from balls and things on the game as well. So we started with the Sonata and you can find that these are nice and tight now, they fit comfortably, they wrap around very nicely and you get very, very good protection. Now the material itself is silk, uh, generally speaking on the really good quality stuff, and it's amazing that silk will not allow a blade to cut through very easily. So if you were hit with a naginat or a sword across here, it will be very well protected. And uh, I actually didn't believe it myself, and we did a test on some um, armour, which was the chain mail on the sleeve, which I spoke about, and it had silk underneath, and full scale with a sword, hitting it as hard as we could, we could not penetrate the silk. Um, sure they had a sore arm if that would have been the case, but um, very, very well protected in that respect. Now, we're going to start moving up the body at the moment. Your feet are always going to be vulnerable in samurai armour, which we'll look at a little bit later. But we're now going to move up to the thigh area. So we've so we got a question. Yeah. So with the uh, splint mm -hmm. shin mail, shin, yeah, shin, shin, yeah. Mm -hmm. with the splint shins, is it covert to wear these under clothes usually, or would they wear it on the outside? No, it's all over the top. And quite often they would just have bare legs underneath, especially if it's in the heat of summer. Uh, depending on where you're going to be fighting is how much armour you would wear. As you can imagine, it can get very hot, very heavy, and if you're marching for any length of time in hot weather, it's not going to be great. So quite often you would be dropping pieces of the armour and wearing as minimum as possible and only putting on the last bits just before the battle. But so once we've got you dressed up, we'll talk about what a battlefield would have looked like because you literally don't just turn up ready to go, you would turn up and get ready to go, if that makes sense. So you often would wear different parts, but this is nearly always worn on the outside. Cool. If you had a, um, the main reason is if you had clothes coming down on the bottom, there's other layers that you need to do. Um, the other thing with Japanese armor as well um, is going to the toilet. It's not easy. 
So you have to make it easy. So by making sure that you don't have too many layers in the wrong places means that you can go if you need to. So there is a bit of an art form of going to the toilet in, uh, in Japanese armour. Um, modern technology is great. You won't notice at the moment, but there is a nice little bit of Velcro in the front there. So if you need to go, you just go and <laughs> you get on with your business. Reddit, uh, Reddit asks, do, we, do you have masks and when would you put them on in relation to which pieces um, you put on? Yeah, oh, well, that will come with the head in a moment. Now, mask-wise, um, the, the mask is called a mempo, which you would wear to protect your face, the same as an English knight would. Um, a mask, as far as if you wanted to cover yourself at night so you weren't being seen, is a different philosophy from the samurai um, at this stage. So the thing is with a samurai, the, I, the, um, the lovely um, Hakama here is very brightly coloured. Now, when a samurai is not on the battlefield and he's not wearing his armour, this is considered are very crass. Bright colours or anything that stands out from the crowd is not considered to be a, a good thing in Japanese society. But when you're on the battlefield, you need to be recognised because being a hero, getting your name recognised and being shown to be really good in battle got you promoted and, and uh, got you a lot more money involved depending on what part of history we're looking at. So they would go overboard and a lot of the colours would mean things, whether it means anything to do with the clan that you belong to or whether it was um, the messages that you wanted to give to the other soldiers the colouring that you would wear would stand out. So we'll have a look at different ones as we we'll get you dressed of what they are, if that makes sense. But uh, from a mask point of view, if it was really cold, you may have a balaclava style mask, but it was probably a wrap around your head. The helmet and everything would have gone on top as well. Cool. Reddit also asks uh, briefly, what weapons are here today? Okay. Well, I've brought the main battlefield weapons that a samurai would have used from the 1400s in the uh, battle of the, uh, up to the battle of Segegahara. Um, they change. Predominantly, we have um, the Yari, the bow, the spear, which is the secondary weapon, and the Naginata is the third choice, uh, followed by the dagger and then the sword. There is a bit of a, a sort of a theory that the, the, the soul of the samurai was the uh, sword and they used it all the time. On the battlefield, the sword is absolutely useless to you against armed samurai. So it was there as a backup weapon, a bit like in the army. I've probably got a nice machine gun, but a pistol in my pocket in last ditch effort, but I'm not gonna go in with the pistol first. It's only as a last ditch effort that you would have a sword. But once we put the weapons on, we'll have a good in-depth look at um, why and, and how we would have worn those and what they were meant to, meant to design for. Cool. cool. Okay. And remember guys, this is like portrait mode, so you're gonna have to tighten up. Tighten it up, all okay. good. Okay, so we wanna move now into the thigh area, and this is pretty much a, a bog standard apron. Um, it's called a haidate. You've got silk across the top, and you've got various styles of mail that you would wear to protect um, the shins itself. Sometimes they're left loose. In this case, you can see these are just loose. But um, also you can have them tied in to make it a little bit tighter. So here's another design, which you can see is a lot tighter. Um, I don't know if you can see this down here, Alwyn. But on this one, we've got chain mail with square plates. This one is solid plate going across. Um, it's all flexible. They're all individual plates to give it flexibility. Um, and certainly you would think this looks stronger than that, but because of the chain mail and the silk, you'll have a lot less weight to carry and just as much protection as you would with all of these. And on the back here, you'll notice that it does have, in this case, a leg strap, so you can actually tie it around the back um, of your leg if you need to. But um, this was probably only worn in, uh, if it was really cold, bearing oh. in mind, for most samurai. Okay, so we just hit 3.6 thousand people. Mm -hmm. So just give a quick introduction. Yeah. People are saying hi now. In hi. Oh. Just quick, quick introduction <laughs> and what all this is. Yeah, so uh, I'm Mike Graham and I've uh, been studying the uh, history of the samurai and the uh, shinobi, but more importantly as a practitioner of the martial arts and learning all of the samurai battlefield techniques going back to the 1400s uh, to up to modern day. Uh, and I do specialise in a lot of fighting with armour and Japanese armour. So today we're having a look at you know, how do you wear the armour, why do you wear it in order, and we'll look at some of the knots and the little secrets of wearing it to fight in as opposed to display what the differences are. And then we'll have a look at some of the weapons and we can get you... Uh, having a bit of fun with those. Isn't and, and, and how do you know me? Just um, oh yes, yeah, so of course, obviously we've uh, met uh, some time ago um, in class. We uh, train together and uh, do a lot of uh, the sort of Japanese martial arts and uh, uh, we have a lot of fun um, in our classes. So. Cool. So a, qu a quick question from Reddit. How do you get this armor? Um, 
There are many places to get armour. Unfortunately, there's many unscrupulous places as well. I would suggest eBay is not the best place to go unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, the pictures that you see advertised, if it's a very cheap price, it won't be what you get. Um, if you go via Japan, it can be very, very expensive, um, but there are some good um, uh, makers out there. I um, This would be a good time to plug. Yeah, iron there you go. Right. Well, obviously, I sell um, Iron Mountain Armoury um, Armour, uh, which comes from China. Um, we've got perfect craftsmen that we've seen spent over 10 years building up their skills, levels to the degree that we can rival Japan and even Japan buy from us now as well. Um, but it's very cost-effective armor, but um, very um, effectively made as well. Yep, uh, failing that, you can come to our, join us weekly mm. at uh, 7, 7 p.m. Tuesdays and Fridays, and we can actually teach you how to build this armor if, you're, if you want to go that far. Mm. It does work out to be cheaper, but there's a time cost. Exactly. So yeah, our usual weekly streams will, we already show you how to do that. So if you want to get your own armor, there's, there's Copy Iron Armory, options, yeah. or you can, we can teach you to make your own. Yeah, we'll contact all in later. We've always got uh, armor that we're looking at. Okay, so we've got uh, basically the apron, as we've said, and this literally is going to go around the waist and uh, we do a little tie at the back. And again, extra tight. Whenever you're putting armor on, you want to make sure you breathe in deep suck it up and you think oh, I can't breathe at the moment the second you start moving around it loosens so if you don't do it tight enough before you know it it's all dropping around your knees what what era would you say this armor is from uh, this one is from the 1400s or 1500s uh, as we'll see as we go on that's the um, sort of the warring states period I'll keep it in the English side of it now um, you can if you want to um, just do a nod up here but you'll notice that there are two little slits in the side and it's quite a, a good practice to start tucking this in so that you keep as much as you can the knots and the lines out of the way of everything else that's moving, especially if you're going to wear a sword underneath your armour. So in this case, we've just tucked it through the two little vents um, here. Um, the other reason these vents are there, they help you when you're displaying it on the box, is the corners of the box just sit in there so it can be quite comfortable. So all I'm going to do here is obviously give it a nice tight little loop. And I'm, I'm going fairly quickly here. I find bows are quite good. If you start getting into sort of double knots and things like that, you'll start sweating while you're training and trying to get those knots undone afterwards is virtually impossible. All right, just, so just, just a small pause here. Lots of people are asking, uh, where can I find this recording to look at later? Well, you can follow us um, by clicking that orange button that you see on the screen right there. That's the follow button. And you can also upvote. By following, you'll be able to see uh, you'll be able to subscribe to my Reddit profile and the, um, it will be saved there as a VOD if you want to watch that later. We are also live on YouTube as well. I'm, I'm not sure if you see the YouTube link. I'm just going to point the screen to the floor so you can see the black hyperlink. So that YouTube, that YouTube well, we're streaming on YouTube as well and it will also be recorded to YouTube. So you can join us there uh, if you can't find it on Reddit. All right, continue. Okay, so um, what we've done here, we've just tied it out of the side and that's sort of just above the hip so it sits comfortably and a little bit tight but it will loosen up. And you just want it hanging slightly, not in front of the legs, but down the sides. And when we look at the weapons you're gonna be using later, you'll understand the shape of your body is gonna be important so that the armor falls into place to protect you, but you keep your flexibility as well. Um, so the Hydati there is to protect the, the, uh, the waist side of things. Now, there's another thing that I'd like to share with you. Uh, I actually didn't know this for years myself. When you get armor for the first time, you get this sort of rather flimsy padded belt. Okay. Doesn't look like much. Um, and when you're displaying your armor on the box, this is what will go around the middle, and you, you'll often see these on most Japanese armors. They've got the, the nice flimsy belt. And then people who have bought the armor go out and train in it and wear the belt the same way. This is not what it's designed with to do it's not strong enough and when you're looking at the belt that uh, is going to be holding your armor in place the weapons you're going to carry on and also the belt is there to hold provisions as well um, it's just not strong enough um, but it does have a very good use when you're wearing armor is you're going to wear it around your waist and you're just going to put a couple of little tucks in it I'll often put the knot off to the side or to the back and the reason that this is padded in a little while you'll be wearing a nice big metal um, body piece which can be quite sharp on the hips, especially when we're gonna cinch it tight so that the weight is carried by your hips and not your shoulders. 
And the last thing you need is all this bruising going down the side, as I found out the hard way. So this is for display only on the outside of the armour, but when you're wearing the armour, you just tie it on the inside, and that will give you a nice bit of padding to protect your hips and your waist as well. And when people start hitting you with weapons and knocking you on the floor, you really appreciate the extra padding there. So that's something a lot of people don't realise when they, they get these belts. Um, this is not meant to be worn on the outside of the armour when you're wearing it. Now, although we're moving from the um, feet up, we're now going to move to the arms next. And we're going to move into the cote, which are the, basically the sleeves. And these are an interesting design. They are um, very flexible and one size fits all sometimes, other than the length of the arm. If you're making your own armour, getting the right sizing um, is quite important. And there's a couple of things on here that uh, we'll have a look at. Now, this is very similar design to the chain mail on your um, apron here. In that, we've got lots of chainmail with square pieces. But again, the protection from impacts and cuts on here is really, really powerful. Um, the spines, like the shin, are there to protect the um, uh, forearms as well. And a nice, loose, uh, fluffy bit um, for your back of your hand. Your fingers will be open the whole time. When we turn it over, there is no armour protection whatsoever. Uh, but it's been designed that you can pull this tight and it will fit you like a glove once we've got it on. Um, now there are different designs that you'll get on here. Some have more armor than others and some have more solid plates. It's, it's just really a matter of choice. The beauty of this one is it's really lightweight compared to some of the others as well, but it gives you the same kind of protection. Now wearing them, we've got uh, basically one thumb piece. Um, so that gives me the indication we've got to come over here. And all we're going to do, um, you'll notice that there's two ties at the side and a couple in the middle. These are not always there, but I would recommend these uh, a little later once you see we finish dressing him with where these are gonna tie. So pretty much you're just gonna slide your arm in here and we're gonna pull it up to the shoulder. And there's a couple of little tags, one for your thumb and one for your middle finger. Now these often two tear off in combat. I'm always um, refixing them on. And then we're just gonna pull it up to the shoulder. And the idea, if I can just turn you slightly sideways, is this top shoulder plate here should just sit over the top of the shoulder and when you bend the elbow you'll notice there's a round plate here this is to help you protect your elbow and that's great for when you're striking people in uh, combat because um, unfortunately um, it's not all about swordsman play the second you get within range of somebody it's anything goes now at this stage we've got the two cords i'm just going to take you some onto the side here and we're going to take the two cords over the shoulder pass it under the arm, okay? Now, when you're someone else is dressing you, you're going to tie them at the back. If you're dressing yourself, you'll tie them at the front for obvious reasons of getting around there. Now, what we want to do is make sure you've got movement here. So you've got to bring your arm forward there. So you'll notice that that's pulled that nice and tight. So that's the maximum leverage we're looking at. And I'm literally just going to tie a simple bow at this stage to hold that in place. It's meant to be fairly loose and tight, um, and they will move around quite a lot, which is where these ties come in. So if we turn around to the front now, you can see it's literally pulled across the front here, under the arm, on the side here. There's still a little bit of flappy movement at the back because of the arm comes forward. If you do it up tight straight away, you can't lift your arm, so that can be quite awkward when you're trying to get into a good bit of bag rope. Now as we turn the, the wrist upwards, uh, we've got some cords coming through here, as you can see, and you can quite literally pull these tight, and it pulls it tight all to the shape of the arm. As it happens, this is actually pr a pretty good fit. And all we're going to do is wrap around and tie normally a bow of some description here. Now you don't want too much cord hanging out, uh, purely because it's gonna get in the way when you're using weapons and things. Um, I've already pre-fitted this, but anything that is loose, you just go back underneath and tie it all up underneath there so it's out of the way. Um, you can also put another cord around the middle or a piece of cloth around the middle to help hold this in place. I don't normally use that too much, um, but if it feels a bit more comfortable to you, you can. But that's pretty much how you wear it on that side. And you'll notice that the fingers are sticking out, but again, there's good reasons for that as we'll have a look at. Now these, on the shoulders, um, this will occasionally start dropping down and it's gonna be a little bit awkward if you're fighting. Um, so what these are gonna be doing, they're gonna to tie to your shoulder guards to hold that up onto your shoulder once we've got everything else in place. Now, the other side's gonna be exactly the same. We're just gonna slide the arm straight in. Oh, there we go. A bit tight, so. 
and just get your thumb and your middle finger. Again, if you bring your arm forward, we can look at the front view on this one. And again, a light leg. Um, rule of thumb here, whenever you're tying these knots, whether it's yourself or somebody else, never tie them under your arms. You do get very hot and sweaty, and that sweat gets into the rope, and it really, trying to get that undone afterwards is a nightmare. And so many people have ended up ripping them off and having to sew them all back on again afterwards. It's just not worth the effort. So never, ever tie them under the armpits, if you can help it. Okay. So that's the sleeves on there. I wouldn't go for a double bow necessarily, but again, uh, with time, you'd tuck it all in the way there for you. So the concept now is that we've got good movements in the arm, the key joints are all protected, your shin, uh, your um, forearms are protected nicely uh, to the shoulders, but your hands are completely free to move. Um, obviously your fingers are sticking out, but when you see the weaponry later, you'll be closing your fingers over weapons, and what you'll notice is that's really well protected. And yet, the other side, you're completely open all the way through here. Uh, the samurai were very um, keen on, they wanted uh, manoeuvrability and flexibility and it was about their skill in fighting that stopped these targets from getting hit. Um, but I have to say, I've, I've trained in um, knights in the proper European armour as well um, and I must admit it was fought, like fighting in a tin can, I'll take my hats off to the guys, those guys, they're seriously fit but movement is very, very difficult. Well, those, what the, some of those guys can do in the European armour is quite amazing. Yeah. Okay, so we're now ready to move into the next stage where we want to start putting the body parts on as well. Now, we saw a slight change in armour from the, um, as I said at the beginning, we were talking about the oeroid, the big armour. This was horseback armour, very boxy, very heavy. But as things started to change, um, the samurai started to get less um, off the horses and down onto their foot, and things changed as calling weapons. So um, instead of that, what they started to do was called lamina, and this was all pieces of armour normally made out of leather, they very rarely use metal, um, that was, um, with leather was then um, put in with um, sort of lacquer over the top to make it nice and watertight as well, and then it was strung together with lots and lots of cord to hold it, so this is a, sort of an Ito um, sort of design on this one, a dashi. Um, is there an advantage to having the kote as separate pieces rather than a shirt? Yeah, yes, it was mainly because they could take them off. Now, as an example, um, if you were on the battlefield and you needed to drop some other stuff off because it was hot or there was damage, as you see, the idea of the battlefield, you cut the cord sometimes to expose the warrior. You can still fight in this a lot easier. Secondly, you could take the sleeve off and wrap it around your head. Um, and they often use that as a head guard um, because obviously you've got lots of arm around here um, and it was just obviously a cultural thing where they did keep it separate. There were shirts that you could get um, that were sewn in as well as collars. You could also get extra padded undergarments as well um, with um, still um, discs in at the same time to wear um, to make it a little bit more comfortable. So if you were a commander and you were going to be wearing the armour for a very long time, obviously you had the money, you would obviously um, make it a lot more comfortable. A normal samurai on the ground, whatever they could steal on the battlefield was what they would wear, basically. Oh yeah, by the way, give a quick shout out to Great Britain. Hey, Great Britain, how are we doing? Lockdown, oh my God, yes. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm not there, I'm sorry to make you sick, but, but um, Australia is uh, uh, starting to lift the restrictions here and it's a, a lovely sunny day in the middle of winter, so which is great. Um, later on, um, once the firearms started to come in, um, they started, instead of each of these being individually made, they started to do whole pieces and then they were laminated together in the same way. Um, it's a lot more rigid and not as flexible, but it gave you a lot more protection against the armour. Eventually they just moved away completely from the, uh, the actual washing um, cord and it was just a solid piece um, that they would put on as well. And they were manufactured either in pieces or in one piece. Um, depending on the, the time. A lot of the armour that you see, um, especially in museums nowadays, is not actually battlefield armour. Um, it, um, it was made in the 1800s, the Edo period as they called it, because the smiths that made the armour had a lot more time. So they made them very beautiful, very ornate, fancy, fancy, fancy. Battlefield armour is very, very basic, simple and effective. Um, and of course, as an armourer back in those days, you had to produce loads of armour, loads of swords, so they were quite often very, very basic and similar. But again, as a commander, where you wanted to sit out, um, you would want something looking really, really nice. Colour-wise, uh, again, we'll cover that once we've got you dressed up. Now, there's a back piece and so a we just, piece. So we just hit 5,000 people, just give another quick summary right. again. 
Yeah, so um, Mike Graham of Musso Shugi Ryu and I Mounted Armoury. Um, I've uh, been training and fighting in samurai armour for about 40 years and uh, even to this day I absolutely love it still. So uh, we're just going through you know, how to wear armour for fighting in training um, and what it would have been like for a samurai at the time and then we're going to move on to some of the weapons they would have used and why the armour's designed the way it was. If you missed the first part, there'll be a recording available later. So we've got a back piece, this is called the Do, D-O, and pretty much this is just going to sit straight across the shoulders like this, okay, and we just need a little support at the back, that will normally stay in place, but okay, I'll get you just to hold that there, just relax your hands. And the front piece is literally going to come up. Now, the um, shoulder guards, again, I'm using as much English as I can here to, to um, sort of go through it, the soldier guards themselves have got little loops, um, and you pop them through the loop like that. Um, they would have made these out of wood and shell, uh, things like that in the, in the days. Um, horn was uh, very, very popular. Nowadays, obviously, we've got great fabrics and plastics. And literally, you've got a toggle on the top that drops down over it, and that's going to hold that in place. Now, at the moment, all of this weight is on your shoulders, but you have some padding in here that comes slightly around the collar and on here. And again, like um, down below, we've got steel plates um, all sewn in there to give you flexibility and to stop that. Now as we hang down here you'll notice that we've got two ties on the side of the armour. All we're going to do is draw the armour in and again we'll do a simple bow. Now when you get armour what you're going to find and I, I'm not sure you, you'll see this yet but if we could just turn sideways there's a little hinge on both sides and there's a pin that can go in there to lock it into place and this side is open to fit. I have never really used the pin because once I start moving and fighting, that pin locks you in place and it finds sometimes the pin tends to pull the um, hinges apart a little bit. I prefer to leave both sides separately and it gives you, can you feel the movement now? It's a lot more comfortable. Now at the moment it's still waiting on your shoulders, we're going to take that off in a minute um, and then we'll show you what all these little parts are on here. So I'm literally going to tie the two sides up here. So we've got the body piece at the front and the back and each one of these has got three tassels hanging off them. Okay, Shokoro. These are all individual plates that are held together, um, but with a gap here that is going to leave you wide open, so you've got no protection on probably a vulnerable area. That's not necessarily going to matter at this stage, okay? But you again, you're protecting your lower body and your upper body on here, and you've got the sleeve protection on here with the shoulder protection. Now, the next thing we want to do is cinch this in place, and we want the weight to come here. Now if you've got really heavy armour, you can also get a rope from the inside and attach it to the inside um, at the bottom, run it over your shoulders and you pull it tight and tie it off at the bottom. And what happens is it takes the weight there and it pulls it to the front. I've never found the need for that uh, because most of the armour I fight in, I get used to very quickly. But if you had some of the really old Uroi armour and it really heavy on the, on the shoulders, you'd want to take it off the shoulder. So it's literally, it ties onto the bottom here, comes up over the top and you pull it over, tie it off on the waist and it puts the weight onto the waist. So it's not a bad little idea if you find it's heavy. So we now move on to the belt or the obi. Now, You'll notice this is quite a lot of fabric here. Um, these are very easy to make with bed sheets. Generally the colour is white or red, but there are variations on this one. There is an argument that white is the sign of purity. So you're wearing this around your middle, um, because the belly button is conceived to be where you know, your soul and everything is, is kept, and white signifies that you are pure of heart. It also white says that if I go onto the battlefield, the colour white says I am either going to die or I'm going to kill you. So I'm not going to be running away, I'm not going to be changing my mind, I'm serious. You will have to kill me or I will kill you. So white is an indication. So there are different colours in samurai culture that you would wear to give a signal to somebody to say, well actually I'm not really going to fight the whole way, I'm just here if I need to be or I will leave if I, I want to as well. But white was a, a standard colour for purity but also to say I'm here to stay. Now the other thing that we need this stage is a little dagger, which we've got down here and I'm just going to get you to hold the dagger. Now this is where a bit of a choice comes in, a samurai of, of how you like to use your weapons. Now we've got two swords that we'll probably be looking at. Uh, one is a, a normal size katana and one is a tachi. Okay? And then we've got also a wakasashi which is a companion sword. Now how you wear these is, is quite often the taste. 
The Tachi is a slightly longer sword and it's got a bigger curve on it. It was designed originally to be drawn blade down on horseback to cut for the, the peasants down. But when you're getting on the ground, it's actually quite cumbersome and gets in the way quite a lot. So a lot of samurai preferred either the wakasashi or a katana worn normally on a belt. So if you're going to wear your katana, you would wear it now underneath the... Oh, so where we had the um, belt on the inside, you'd be wearing that through the belt on the inside and then putting your armour over the top of it, and that would literally hang down over the top. Okay? I don't favour that personally. Okay? I can still tuck my katana in if I want to across the belt. Again, it's quite often with a, a soldier over your personal choice. Officers would obviously wear the touchy and it would be worn around the waist on the outside with a separate belt. And that's what we're going to look at today. And then when we move into why the fighting goes on, you'll see why all the different variations would come into play. So, how much, how much pressure or blood force trauma can the armour take? Um, I've tried it on dummies and I've been beaten senseless with sticks and bow staffs and clubs and everything else. Um, to be fair, the armour is designed to absorb the impact. So I, I would say um, if it was a, a massive sledgehammer hitting you in the head, you're going to know about it, but you'd probably be okay. We did test a, a helmet, uh, which was the lamina, so it was all made up of spines going across, which I'll show you when we put the helmet on. What happens is the helmet exploded outward so that the impact didn't go in through the head. Um, it was quite amazing. But most of this is, because it's flexible and you can move, the impacts that you take, you hardly feel. You'd have to be run over by a horse to really know about it. Um, I could probably strike uh, blades into your arm here. I could probably break your arm, but I probably wouldn't be able to cut through. So there's lots of variations, but a surprisingly hard amount. I did fall out of a tree 20 feet high in armour and landed on my back and didn't feel a thing. Um, I got straight up again and it protected me and I was actually quite amazed because I was expecting some serious pain. So I, you know, a bit of an accident and don't ask me I was up 20 feet up a tree, but I need to test armour and I like to train as real as I can. So we're going to come back to the sword, but if we were in the katana you may want to consider doing that uh, at this stage. Now, the belt uh, we're going to put on now, okay, the shirashi. We're going to start by keeping it quite tight, and we want it to be where the body, um, part of the dough, is in here, and we're just going to wrap it round here. Now, this is the interesting bit. We want to cinch it quite tight. Now, if I had, uh, you had assistance, if not, you could do it yourself, but you're going to grab one end, and I'm going to grab the other. You're going to breathe out, and we're going to pull. And we suck it right in, nice and tight. Can you feel how that's taken all of the weight from your shoulders now? Yeah. Feels a big difference, doesn't it? Now, depending on what's going to happen next, if I'm marching for a while, you want to carry lots of things on here. So again, like we said with the straw sandals, you'd be wearing a set on your feet, you'd have a set hanging from your belt, and then you'd be making some as you walk along to add to the belt later. If you were doing archery, you would hang extra bowstrings on here and things like that. Food you'd wear around your neck in a completely different way in a pack. So you would hang things that you would want on campaign off of here. But at the moment, what we want is the dagger. Now, I'll probably suggest at the moment the uh, dagger or a keichi, depending on which uh, version you're using, um, is probably the single most important weapon to carry on you. Because when things get down and dirty and close, the one thing <coughs> you'll get through armour every time is one of these. But people want to steal yours as well. And all I'm going to do is literally do a uh, over-the-top and under, okay. sorry, under and over, over and under, okay? So what we've pretty much done is like a little cross across it, and we just want to position it so it's just slightly off. Now, in many of these, this one hasn't got it. If I can get you to turn sideways, there's often a little hook at the back here, and that hook would be put through the belt so that when you needed to pull it out quickly, it wouldn't pull the whole thing out. It would keep the, the sayer itself in place, and the dagger would just pop out. Okay? But in this case, what I've done is I've done it so that it's being held in place by the belt, but you can still get it out if you needed to. So again, this is kept nice and tight. I'm just going to suck it in a bit more. And I'm just going to do just a double knot here. And anything that's sticking out, you just wrap around and wrap around until it's gone. If I've got something I want to add in there, like the slippers, I put it in, wrap it around, put something else in, wrap it around. And this will literally disappear and wrap it around. So what you'll find is, hopefully, you can feel that's taken all the weight off your shoulders now. Okay? And it's quite comfortable. Um, we'll come to what all these things are in a minute. Now, on the sleeves, when we put the sleeves on earlier on, the cote, we said that these will move and start to fall down a little bit. 
So all I'm going to do is just tuck that up, up underneath and we've got the two cords on the top. Now this is where the shoulder guards go. You've got two options now. One is to go through the loops and put the shoulder guards on, which is what a lot of people do. I will say it's really painful to do and trying to get them off afterwards is hard. I suggest there's another way of doing it. We're going to take the shoulder guards and put them on first and wrap the cords around it as I'll show you. You can just do it. Yeah? yeah. That's not what we do it properly. Those two options. Now, there's again different kinds of shoulder guards. These are going to match the armour. Uh, quite often, that when you finish the campaign, you're wearing completely mismatched armour because as it broke, no armour is you would pick up somebody else's kit, put it on, so your, all your matched armour won't be matched at the end of it. Um, now, this has got some semblance to old armour on here. You can see, and these tassels and tassels at the back, I'll explain for what they are in a moment. The newer armour didn't really worry about that anymore. They moved on and it was very, very simple. He said almost identical. Um, again, you've got the option for tassels. Many of them just took it out. But uh, the gold bit here in the tassel is meant to go to the back. So that tells me that's that shoulder. And obviously we've got this shoulder here. Now, there's two fittings you'll find on most armour. One is simple. It's a simple tog, toggle. And you pop the toggle through and pull it down on top. So we'll turn around sideways in the light. You lift the toggle up. That goes in underneath and that just comes down on top to hold it in place. So it's nice and easy in place like that. The other right, one Mike, that you'll Mike, often uh, see... So we, we, we're going to have to restart the stream. Okay. So, so this is sort of like a commercial break. We only have three minutes of live air left, so this okay. would be an excellent time to plug who you are yeah. and where they, can they find you and, okay. and the stream. So yeah. here we go. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Mike Graham. I run a class called Muso Shugyu Ryo Australia, um, which is the art of the samurai, and we focus on the different fighting arts from the 1400s up through to modern day, and we look at um, all the techniques that would have been used by an actual samurai on the battlefield as with the armour and the history as well, which is quite good. Um, come and see us on Facebook, Muso Shugyu, M-U-S-O-S-H-U-G-Y-O, and you'll find us on there. Um, we'd love to, to get in touch with you. And obviously you found us on the stream, so this is Sep Seppai TV, spelled with a five. Um, do click that orange button that's roughly over here to follow the, uh, follow the Reddit stream. Um, we're, we're usually here Tuesday and Friday, this is a special event, so Tuesday and Friday, 7 p.m. Um, making the armor. So for those who want their own armor and don't really want to spend a lot paying someone to make it for you, we'll teach you how to make it yourself. Um, so join us on those sessions and uh, consider like, and if you do need to go right now, um, consider upvoting, consider following. The YouTube link is also at the top here. So um, consider subscribing as well. We will be restarting the stream, so don't you worry. Uh, we'll be taking a small break and uh, we'll be back doing the rest of it. So don't worry. And if you, uh, if you can't really view it right now, there will be uh, VODs available on the YouTube and, and Reddit. So thanks, thanks for joining us. So we've got like two minutes. All right, Do cool. I hear something about coffee? No, it's a lie. It's a lie. No. Do you want right, we'll take a small break, guys. <laughs> so, uh... Right, I'll carry on with the other side. <laughs> Does anybody else want to drink while I'm in there? So I drink coffee? Coffee. <laughs> oh. Sending me to make coffee. No, no, he needs to sleep in about three hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How's it feel so far? So, so we still, we still got uh, ten minutes running airtime left, but we could just point it at something okay. so they can study so the what arm. happens afterwards and so is it another stream afterwards you would have to yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay. so we'll just have to restart it okay um yeah because because reddit only allows you to stream 45 minutes ah, i got it right yeah and we're reaching YouTube finger time uh youtube is yeah. youtube is streaming as well we're so, still streaming now yeah yeah exactly so uh, it's only reddit uh that's oh, that's okay. the advantage of following us to youtube so it's not interrupted <laughs> right uh, yeah, right, right, right. All right, well, we're going to grab a quick coffee right now. You can just study um, the piles of armor we have. Here is here's all, here's a lot of everything. We'll be right back. Just give us a moment. I mean, feel free to give gold if you like. Uh, keep the stream running, but we're going to take yeah, a bit of time. Yeah, you want coffee? Yes, please. I think she's getting it. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. 
Yeah, now, um, they used to use, um, often deer skin was quite a good one. Um, in the summer it can get very hot, but especially commanders, um, it stops the, the blood and the oil and the sweat and everything from making things slippery, and they'd often wear those underneath. But once you've got the gloves on, it's very difficult to peel you know, skin with your hands and stuff, and it's all dyed on. Um, I don't like gloves unless it's freezing cold. Bear in mind, most of them I would have gone out in the freezing cold. But yeah, and many of them would have had um, deer skin gloves of some description to wear underneath just to help protect. Um, it's amazing sometimes when you're fighting how you, your fingers get banged on the armour, especially when you've got little sharp bits sticking out and you can end up with a few cuts and things, but um, gloves will save you. I'm not a lover of gloves, I just don't use them normally. Yeah. Different kinds of helmet down here, I'm, uh, hopefully you guys uh, can still see on the screen. Um, this is a, pretty much a simple battlefield one called the Zinari. Uh, this was one of the main ones that uh, was worn. Um, it shrunk down in size quite dramatically from the older armour, mainly due to the fact that the fighting styles changed. Um, it was less about arrows and spears, it was more about guns and uh, uh, things like that, so they've kept it very simple. And a lot of these angles have been designed to help um, you know, deflect bullets and things like that. Um, the, the shape of the neck is also coming tighter to help protect the neck as well. Uh, once we've got them dressed, we'll show you. So this is what we call the Zunari. There's a, a few different designs we can put on there. Um, we then move over to um, something that's a little bit more sturdier, but it is a lot heavier. It's a laminar design, and this is the pumpkin head. Um, again, if you look at it sideways, it's a bit more like a pumpkin shape. Um, and each one of these pieces is a separate piece that has all been put together. And as anything impacts this, what it does is the metal and the joints expand to take the impact away from the actual wearer as well. Everything else is pretty similar. Um, you've got protection on the eyes and we'll go through the, the wings and everything once we've got you on there. Uh, but again, this is a lot heavier um, and you wouldn't want to be wearing it for a long period of time as well. Um, the other kind of thing that they really want as well is the jingasa. Um, Quite often as a junior samurai or a, 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 a sort of a, a light foot soldier or ashigaru, um, these were quite popular as well. I have to say, very comfortable to wear, you get lots of air around and especially when you've got metal, the angles cause any blows just to slide off very easily. I can also take it off, hit people with it, which is quite nice, this could be a very good weapon at the same time, um, um, but I like this as well, keeps the sun off much better than some of these. Um, now this has got a hole in the top, uh, very nicely decorated, so it lets some air in here to the wearer. Some say that you know, the samurai used to pull their hair out of it, there's no real evidence that I found that that was a popular thing to do. Um, it's, no one really knows what this hole is for. Um, I think the, the idea is where all the rivets come together and all the plates come together, as they all bend over there's got to be a hole. So this is really what it's designed for, so they've, uh, they've done it. The downside of having a hole is you can't do what most soldiers would do with a Zunari. In the evening, uh, they turn it upside down and it's now a cooking pot. So this is what they would cook their rice and, and food and things like this in. And it becomes a cooking pot and then they've got their bowl and their rice at the same time. So this was quite multi-purpose um, sort of design as well. In the real piece, mm, it does, yeah. Um, it's um, like the Middle Ages, it was um, a completely different time and world. Um, this is another favourite for many of the samurai as well, especially when the, the armour fighting wasn't great and they were in the hills, it was a lot more about movement. And it's pretty much just a simple um, head guard, i take the glasses off on that, that just protects my cheek and it protects my forehead and I can wear this around quite comfortably, it ties on. And I, I'm quite amazed at how comfortable this is to wear and how many times I've been hit with wooden swords uh, and the impact there, it just completely protects you. Um, it looks like my face is wide open, but um, it's amazing what you can do when you're moving to stop those blows coming in. Um, again, when we've got the helmet on you, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about how comfortable it is and what you need to be aware of. Um, most samurais um, didn't really like wearing the helmets or the face masks, if they could help it. Oh, the knees are going. Thank you very much. Nice little coffee there. Uh, Mike, yes. uh, how do you spell your Facebook? I'll just send it quickly off. Oh, yeah. M-U-S-O. S-H-U-G. M-U-S-O. Yes. Yeah. Separate word, S, S H U G, uh -huh. Y O, mm -hmm. and then separate word, R Y H. What's up? R Y U, Australia. I took the website down. Ah, oh, that's a shame. But I won't.
Um, the thing about getting up, that, that what the charges were, and I, I was getting more through Facebook than I was through the website. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, hopefully through this. Maybe. I've just got to press the button and activate it again. No, no, well, not, not the site, but hopefully through this, mm. we'll get some traffic in mm. there. I mean, I think people people are, are supporting your heaps right yeah. now. Uh, we, you're, you're hitting, you're hitting what our world mm. of, of best, personal best, you're, you're mm. hitting like five and a half thousand people. Exactly. So that's, that's enough to go full time. Mm. Yeah. But anyway. I, I got to admit that um, I'm, even to this day, of all the demonstrations and everything we've ever done, how people are fascinated with the samurai and the armor. It's just we do demonstrations at uh, lots of different places and charity events and movies and people so, just so like, here's wow. here's the thing if you just want to take a break and just want to take the helm this mm -hmm. is this is chat it's coming through live okay so you can just have this is q a we'll do a q a for yeah. you guys it's it's it seems a bit pointless we'll take a bit of a break but we can still do it so yeah of course camera is right here hi and then there we go let's have a look thumbs up yeah, goes armor. Yeah, that shit doesn't work well against armor. <laughs> okay, not sure what the question is there, guy, but um, yeah, I think um, I was saying to the guys here, it's um, the the fascination I think even from me of, of the samurai armor and everything that it was all about. I, I think from uh, kids growing up and the swords and everything right the way through to uh, you know, my age in my sixties now, uh, it, it's just a really really um, interesting. Now, how much does a set of armor cost? Um, which, Great question. Um, listen, I tell you straight, you can go onto eBay, you'll have a fantastic picture, probably of an Iron Mountain armor, and it'll be $500. You'll probably end up paying a fortune in shipping, another $800 on that. What arrives is not armor. It is a very cheap copy that I would suggest you just, it's gonna be completely worthless. Um, if you think it's uh, too good to be true, that's fine. By all means, if you ever see armor, you're not sure. Um, if you contact me via Musho Shuguriu, if you find us on uh, Facebook, I'm happy to look at it. I can quite often tell you. Um, but again, it depends on the quality. Now, I'll talk for Iron Mountain Armory because obviously I've been involved with them from an early stage. And although I, I'm not uh, doing the UK dealership anymore, I can still have access to the armor as well. Um, we have three different qualities. Um, one quality is um, the Taisho. Now, this is top of the range, museum quality. If you want everything looking absolutely real and right and silk and the best materials, um, you could be looking, and I'll talk in Australian dollars at the moment, uh, anywhere between five, seven thousand dollars um, upwards, depending on what you're looking for. The next range is Gashira. Now the Gashira I use all of the time for my fighting. Um, it is really good quality, it looks the part, there's a few synthetic materials in rather than silk potentially, but the detail is there and it's really hard wearing. You could be looking at sort of about 4,000 Australian dollars for that. Then there's the Kachi range, which is very, very basic. There's a lot of things cut back, but to be fair, if you didn't know, you would never know it was missing. But it is good hard wearing armor, and if you wanted to get started with a cheap kit, um, you could probably pick those up for about $2,000 or so. But again, it all depends on the model that you want, the sizing that you want, because we can actually size it, shape it through the color schemes, and customize it completely for you. Um, but uh, generally speaking, it's probably about um, a tenth of the price that you would pay if you went directly to Japan for the same kind of thing. So. Templates of the armour, I don't, uh, because we actually have to work via the factory under contract, uh, all of the templates that we have uh, are obviously um, copyrighted for a reason. Uh, there's a lot of um, copycat factories that would like to copy those as well. But there are plenty out there, there's a few things like that. Oh, um, but, got uh, a Viking fan here. They are brilliant. I fought with Vikings. Amazing guys. But speaking of uh, templates, there are there is a translated uh, Japanese armour manual that does have templates you can use. And that's the mm. templates I use for my armour. Mm. So there is a, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. yeah. Now how much does the armour weigh? Um, you probably, if I talk in pounds, I, I say I've come to Australia recently and I'm still getting used to the uh, metric and imperial and all this kind of stuff and centimetres and inches. But about 65 pounds or so, so um, when you're wearing it completely. But because it's distributed throughout the body, it's actually um, very, very comfortable to wear once you get used to it as well. Um, yeah, there are, they did have armour that could um, withstand bullets. Um, a lot of it was about the um, shape of the armour and the thickness of the metal as well. And you will see sometimes where they've tested armour and there is actually bullet holes in there. But unfortunately, you do get a lot of unscrupulous dealers that will sort of put little bullet holes in there and tell you it's an authentic um, Edo period when actually um, it isn't uh, as well. So we're raging through there. Original armour out there, that was a question we, we talked about earlier on. Uh, 
I would say this is my subjective opinion. I've looked for original armour. Because most of it was made out of leather um, and cotton and silk and things, it rotted away a long time ago. Um, there's been a lot of um, people looking after original armours and, and redoing it up and reconstituting it. Um, so I, I think for me, the original battlefield armour doesn't exist anymore. Um, it may have been renovated quite a lot and had lots of new parts added, um, but again, is it the original armour when it's being rebuilt with scratch with other materials? Um, it, it's a catch-22 on that one. But to be fair, most of the armour you see is Edo period from the 1800s out there. There's not much that you can truly date back um, that is original anymore, and it's very hard to find. Um, so um, I, I would say probably not is the case, but there's been a lot of uh, renovations on it as well. Um, how much would the armour stand up against 9mm? Probably fairly well, as long as you've got the right armour. Um, there are different kinds of um, uh, armours that you would have from different time periods as well. So if you were looking at something from the later period of the 1600s, 1700s, it would have been designed uh, more about uh, the weapons and stuff like that, So, uh, which is quite good. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Calibre-wise, to be fair, I can only base it on what I've seen of the period of the time. They, they had the muskets and the, 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 sort of the uh, matchlock rifles and things like that with the balls. Um, they were quite good at um, you know, stopping bullets uh, once they got going. Modern weapons with everything they've got now, it may well cut through like butter, but again, it's a different time period um, looking at it that way. So it's, it's probably quite hard to tell of what an actual armour would have um, been able to withstand from modern weaponry as well. Uh, which is why you know, samurai armour changed over the years as well, adapting to what was going on at the, uh, the time. Um, would one of those helmets... Um, do you need a break to drink coffee? Or? No, I can drink and work, it's fine. So if we're good to go. Oh, no, like, yeah. take a break, because like, oh, they, no, they no, also I'm... were interested in like, yeah. what you can do by yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's hand over so you can uh, have a look at the, what you can cool. do. By. So, uh, yeah. just whenever you're ready, just give me a second. Oh. Yeah. Feel the difference in weight. <laughs> yeah, that's so this is quite a nice heavy gauge, isn't it? This is it a, is heavy gauge. Job. That is mm. 14 gauge steel, so it's 1.6 mm. millimeter. Uh, this is this is something I built myself. Um, so it just goes to show what you can do by yourself. Mm. Um, steel in Australia is super cheap. It's cheaper than leather, actually. So you can just upgrade straight to steel. Um, 1.6 millimeter. It is a Edo period armor because and you can tell because there's only like eight plates, so eight main uh, horizontal lamellars, um, and uh, this lacing here, shoelace. So you can so modern day like shoelace, will, it's a modern material will outdo any of the stuff that mm. they had back then. It's also waxed, so it will, it will last a lot longer. Mm. Underneath underneath each. Uh, um, keel or at each cross here there is also an added um, lashing of leather uh, in this case it's kangaroo leather and that is what gives the armor its shape as you can tell this is basically a shutter guard um, without without the without the uh, leather rivets it will collapse in on itself like a like an accordion um, but it's because of the, that those leather rivets it's holding itself up and that essentially what that means, we were talking very much about redirecting the weight of the armor onto your hips. And the way you do that is by wearing that cloth, the cloth belt, that belt. Right. So this is also not possible if your armor collapses in on itself, right? So your armor needs to stand up by itself. So you do that mod. You can do it with rivets, but I chose to do it with leather. So it just goes to show what you can do by yourself. It's not impossible. And it is uh, cheaper again by a factor of 10 um, from Japan to Iron Army mm. to making yourself, but the cost is time. Mm. So this is, this, the front and the back um, was uh, like, a, I would say it, would, it has been, been almost nine months now. So it, it's a very, it's a very time consuming build, but it's really simple. So it hasn't just, been every day though, has it? Hasn't been every day. Like two days a week, uh, nine months. Mm. So if you did it full time, you could probably roll it out in six, maybe less. Mm. But it is a heavy gauge steel. And as do you do know the thicknesses of- uh, Yeah, we work to basically a nine, mil, uh, nine gauge. So yep. about, you know, is that, is that what it was back then? Or yeah, the, well, a lot of it wouldn't have been steel until the sort of the yeah, 15th I mean. century. A lot of it would have been leather. Um, so yeah, it's actually very quiet and comfortable and it's not as big, but uh, obviously with the, in, 
implementation of firearms and things like that, um, what we saw is the, um, the metal starting to come in instead of leather as well. They also found out it was a lot quicker to make it when they needed bulk armour as well. So that was one of the big changes that we saw. But yeah, nine mm, eight, eight nine millimetre was pretty standard. Or okay. Gauge, sorry, eight nine gauge. Yeah, funny, funny you should mention that question. Can the highest quality samurai be compared to the best quality medieval European armour? Um, it's actually funny because since the introduction of muskets, um, Oda, uh, Oda Nobunaga, Oda Nobunaga, Oda Nobunaga. Yeah, the, the conqueror and all of, of all of Japan, the, the, the guy who unified all of Japan, um, actually adopted European armour towards the end. Um, because matchlock systems were starting to be used by foot soldiers, so it didn't make sense to have your highly elite warriors um, continue to wear outdated armor. So they actually adopted European single plate armor. Mm. I forget the name of it. There's definitely pictures out there, mm. but um, that know? really blurs the lines. So if you're asking straight up, yes, because the samurai did eventually, towards the end, adopt European armor. To, to like literally deflect bullets. Mm. Um, samurai armor was not really quite able to do, do that because it was a system of, of uh, scales, leather scales that were lacquered over and then laced, mm. right? Um, even if that was iron, um, the fact that they were scales is still weaknesses in the armor. There, there are seams and there are places where it just dents inwards, very similar to how like chain mail can't re it's not really good versus stabbing attacks because what ultimately it takes to get through is just a separation of one ring similar and and scale mail is quite the same so good on him he, he managed to keep up with the times and adopt mm. um european single plate which was able to keep his guys alive cool okay yeah. right sure we come back to here we were talking about popping the sode or the shoulder guards on um, All right. Oh, well, we'll get back into yep, position. Yep. It doesn't look like we need to reset. We still have three and a half minutes. We'll see okay. how long we can run it out. Okay. If we need to reset, I'll we'll keep reset. Resetting. Yeah. So, Absolutely. All right. We will resume the stream. Uh, hello. This is me. This is Sepai TV, and I am the camera guy. If you were wondering where the thumbs up was coming from. All right. So here we go. Three, two. There we go. We're on. So we've popped the uh, sode or shoulder guards on. Um, in the olden days, this would have been a great big shield, um, which was great against arrows and things, but with weapons changing and firearms coming in, these became smaller and smaller. When you've got your own one as well, you can bend them a little bit to shape just by curving them into the arm. Uh, most of the arm, when you wear it for the first time, you want to bend it into shape. So I kind of put it on you, but you could literally get on it bend it, make it fit your body perfectly. At the moment, you'll probably find if you run out on this, there'll be a few areas you might go, need to bend that in, bend that out. But that's, that's perfectly fine as well. They occasionally had a lace underneath here so that you could tie it onto your arms, but it wasn't a particular um, you know, a thing that they liked. Now, uh, going back to the shoulders themselves, we've got the sleeves here with two um, cords coming off. And I said just before we had the break, the sode or shoulder guards were put on using toggles. But you can also, in some of the older styles, just have two pieces of lace, which would look exactly the same as this. Now, all these do is go through the eyes in the, uh, the um, sorry, the um, shoulder guard here, shoulder brace, um, and just tie on. So all I've done here is I've put the shoulder guards on first, and I don't know if you can swap down just a little bit without breaking your legs, but you know, uh, there we go. So uh, we've literally come either side of the two pegs for the shoulder guards, and I'm just simply going to tie them nice and tight with a bow. Uh, not too worried about where this cord goes, uh, we'll just leave it there and you can jump up. And what that's now done is that secured this nicely and comfortably at the top of your arm so you stop that slippage down. So you've now got the movement that you need this way, but it will also stop it coming down. I'll do exactly the same on this side here. Again, I generally will try where I can to position it first rather than pull it into place. So I've positioned it up and then I'm just going to come around the back here. And I'm just going to briefly, before we go any further, talk to you about some of the things that you'll see on the front um, and explain what they are. 
Thank you. You jump up. Now, you will see on a lot of armour these little rings here, um, and you've got nice little tassel cords, um, partly for decoration, but uh, these were quite functional if you're a commander. Um, you'd often have a war fan that you would be using to guide your troops and things like that. Um, it could be like a, a wand with lots of um, paper coming off the top that you could attract attention. They used to just hook it up underneath here and it would hang. So it was like their baton for commanding the battle. They just hooked it up onto these little nipple belts. Um, these were, this is a, a remnant from a, an older style armour. Um, in the older style armour, with great big um, sode that were coming out to the sides and great big head pieces oh. here, you needed to be able to pull them around depending on what was going on with the battle. So all of these cords would be designed to loop through and tie everything into place. But they've left them there as kind of a, a memory of the old day. Now if we can turn you around, what you'll notice is another part of the old day. Again, these are nice, these aren't really going anywhere, and especially if you bend them to shape, they'll stay where they are. But if you can imagine this is the really big shoulder guard, there's, uh, these would be falling everywhere, and you don't want them falling too far forward or too far back. So what would happen, you have a choice. You can either tie them up together here, or you can use the two loops on here um, to secure them, and that would stop them from falling forward. Now, because we're gonna be wearing a jacket, I'm not going to do these up. If we were wearing this like this, this is quite a nice little design that you would do. But you can see, it just stops these from falling forward, if it was the old style. But the reason a lot of the armors at this stage left it, because it was like a memory of the old days, it was an older design they just wanted to hang on to. Very quickly, we saw that disappear. And when we move into the newer armor down here, where especially when it was um, less fancy, these completely disappeared, because they were just non-essential anymore. But this was a, a, like a throwback from the old days as well. Now I'm just going to leave these hanging for the time being because we're going to dress you up in a jacket as well that will go over the top. So as we swing around, uh, these are some of the sort of the details that you can see. Occasionally on armour, um, especially some of the, the more older styles that you can find that have been well looked after, um, there's little loops here. And these loops were designed that you could fold up the tassels here and then tie them off. Now this was quite useful if you were swimming. You could tie all of that up here nice and tight, get them up and out of the way, um, which is quite good. Um, and it also gave you a lot more freedom of movement because they, when, you know, when you're walking, they're bashing around the whole time. And if you needed a bit more quiet, although this is still, you, you get a nice sort of sound when you're walking along. But imagine this was in the old days made of leather, you wouldn't have that sound necessarily. But that was a great way to get them hooked up out of the way as well. Some of them would also have a piece of cord along the top that these were attached to. And if you undid the cord, you could do away with all of these um, lower parts of your protection as well, and just drop them if you needed to. Because there were signs when you got into rivers or if you were on a boat and you went overboard, you needed to get it right very quickly, but you would dress accordingly. If it's a really hot day and you're in the mountains, you probably wouldn't have even bothered with this. Uh, so you would have dropped off bits and pieces as you went along. Uh, so now we've pretty much we've got a dagger in place, we've got the body in place as well, we just need to now move up towards the head area. Now this is where it does get really interesting, I mean, during the break we were talking about some different areas. Um, <coughs> very popular, a lot of people have been talking about you know, the, the firearm side of things. This design is Zunari and this directly came from firearms. We find that we've got a solid steel of plate there, a solid steel of plate here and a solid vision here. Uh, and it was designed so that it would split apart, but all the angles were designed to deflect musket balls and bullets coming off the side of it. Also, in the old days, you would have your uh, shikoro, the, the shoulders, right out here, so everyone could see who you were. But you don't want musket balls getting in and wrapping around on the inside, so they closed it right up again as well. So that was quite a popular style. Um, we saw another style here, which is the one that goes with this armor. This is the lamina as well, so each one of these is a separate piece of steel coming down. And again, if an impact comes in, it pops the rivets and they just pop out to take the impact away. But again, this has been designed a lot more towards the, the armour as well. Now, helmet-wise, these are take a lot of getting used to. Um, the way that you tie them, depending on the battle and the way that you're going to fight, and many clans had their own secret ways of tying knots um, so that they keep it on. But the idea was you would tie this onto your head so it doesn't come off. But if you got into trouble, you could duck your head and come straight out of it. Because in a lot of instances with any kind of combat, once you move close distance, it is hand to hand. And if I start grabbing you around the helmet and taking control of you, which is why in a lot of military, they don't actually Jesus. get their chin straps up. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jack, for giving us 15 minutes of extra airtime. We we're running out and now. We're just, we have so much airtime now. Fantastic. 
Um, now the cords that hold it here, these are just a, a softer cord. I would recommend if you're ever doing your own, don't get rough cord because you're going to be wearing this around your, your chin and things, it can get quite painful. Um, but many of them, as you'll see when it comes to fighting later, I want to cut the cords away. So they would put chain through the middle of these cords just to make sure that that couldn't happen as well. But to be fair, you can feel the weight of that. Okay. It's not overly light, it can be quite cumbersome. So the concept is you don't really want to wear this until you have to. So if I had a couple of servants, they'd be carrying it with me. If not, you just literally, you're going to tie it around your back and it's going to be slung over your shoulder like that, tied on, and you'd carry it. Just as you're going into battle is when you put your helmet on. The last thing you want to do is wearing that for any time. Obviously, if you're doing a, one of the little parades out of town, you'd be wearing it the second you're out and it comes off again. So again, it can also be worn around the belt, but most of the time it was being slung over the shoulder as well. But we'll put you on this in a minute. What's the book on the Okay, I'll show you that. That's where you're going to put um, a nice fancy design so that you can be recognised, called a mon. And that will go on to the, the oh, sorry, made arte, that will go on to the front. Now another area that uh, we've got to be thinking about is face masks. Now uh, this is called a mempo, and there's two parts to it really. One is the cheek guard, you've got a nose guard, and this is going to protect your throat, because you'll notice you're very open here. Okay? A lot of the reasons you need to know where the openings are is it's how you're going to be fighting somebody as well. Now, there was a few designs that were full face. Samurai, there's no history they ever wore them. They were there more for display purposes as well, because you don't need narrow vision with little slitty eyes and you can't breathe. The other thing that you'll find with the Mempo is once you're wearing this, okay, again, I would probably shake this to my face a little bit. This is pressing quite heavily against my nose. If I get any kind of impact into here, that's gonna dry straight back up into my nose, which is not the best. This is designed to scare you a little bit. I'll take my hat off there. This is designed to scare and look very scary but protect the cheeks. But what you'll find with most of the mempos that you get um, is that you have detachable noses. So this is a hell of a lot more comfortable. So going into battle like this is much better than having the nose on. So what would often happen, uh, the nose would come off, you'd be popping it down the front. We'd have several other things down there as well to pick up later. I've got a question. Yeah. Why does it have moustache? Ah, now that's a really that's a good question. There's a lot of controversy over moustaches. Let me show you this one over here. An excellent question. An excellent question. Take a look at that uh, little baby. Now, there's all different designs that you get on moustaches. There is a view um, that the moustache itself, the longer the moustache was, the more older a warrior you are. And obviously, if you've survived a load of battlefields and become very old, you're going to be a very fearsome fighter. So it was there to scare. To be fair, that's probably more myth than anything else. It is purely to scare people. The more scarier you can make it look, or the more you can give yourself an image that means you're recognised, the guy with that big bushy walrus moustache armour, that's what you're looking for. So technically, the, it's more about um, the looks than it is the, the fact that you're a fierce warrior as well. Um, but there's lots and lots of different designs and colours, to be fair. This has come off with fighting quite a lot. They, they come off quite a lot. Secondly, I find the hairs all get up there and it oh, drives you nuts when you've got all this hair hitting you in the back of the nose. So it sort of sneezes. But again, they're detachable. Now, there's a couple of ways that you want to decide before you put your helmet on. Are you going to wear your mempo or are you not? There are two different methods. There's a classic scene which I love. I love The Last Samurai. I know it was a Hollywood movie and all that kind of stuff where the boss, he's got all tied in and he comes out and he just goes like that and takes his mempo off and he really reveals his face. Unfortunately, when this is tied in, it's not going anywhere. So the decision is, am I wearing it, am I not? That will decide how you wear the helmet. So I'd like to show you both ways, if that's okay. I think we've, we've got time to do that. Now let's look at with, um, with the mempo first, um, and then without it, or do you want to do it the other way around? Let's do all of it. Let's do all of it. Right. Well, I'll put the mempo on afterwards. Okay. Now, basically, when you're putting your helmet on, we're going to tuck it all out of the way, and we've got three anchor points here. Okay? This is just really um, loose material that's held in place around the side. You will find when you wear armour, it's always coming loose. You're always gluing and repairing it, but that's part of the fun of wearing armour. Okay? I'll often put a little bit of padding around the outside, just to make it a bit more comfortable. Was that glued in 
traditionally? No, no. This, oh, yeah, um, yeah, it glued. Often they would have sewn it around the edges. They would have little pinholes, you would sell it. But most of the time they did have glue back then, it was glued in. You're Especially if I'm going to use they, it. They cooked food in yeah. the helmet. Yeah. So they had the cloth there while yeah. they cooked okay. No, 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 they would take that out as well. Oh. Yeah. Oh. But technically, if I'm boiling rice, you could leave it in there. Uh, which is fine. Yeah, obviously this one has got a hole in the top, so this wouldn't be a cooking pot, um, but equally that's the same thing. The other option is they wouldn't have any kind of padding in there at all. They would have worn a sort of a, basically a beanie or an eboshi, which is a, a, a sort of a hat that they would wear that squashes down. Um, also, there's an argument that the top knot design that they used to wear, that they used to have a, a sort of bald head, just like me, at the top, and then fold it over the top, that was about wearing a helmet because it was very uncomfortable. Um, so where a lot of the hair designs apparently came from wearing helmets as well. But um, we'll look at wearing it. Now, the three anchor points are quite simple. Number first thing you need to do is get roughly equal lengths down here. And I'll show you a couple of ways to tie it, easy and more hard. What you want to do is pull the cord so that you've got two pieces sticking out. This is where your ears are going to be. Okay? You need to clear this because your head needs to go in the middle and you don't want the rope on the inside of your head. Okay? And literally, all we're going to do is sit it straight over the top. And you've got safety glasses, but I don't think they're going to get in the way. Now, what you've got is one piece hanging down under your ear here and one piece hanging down under your ear here. Now, if I'm just doing a demonstration piece, I'm going to be honest with you, you're just going to tie a bow. You pull it tight, you tie a bow like that, okay? And then once you've tied the bow, these loose bits, you're just going to tuck like that, okay? And it's very simple, very easy, and you've got a little bushy bit there. If we fought in that though, you can see you're only being held by one piece. So I'll, I'll show you how we're going to wear that if we're actually going to fight in it. So we're going to bring our two pieces down here, and hopefully I'm going to with the light we can see this here, okay? All I'm going to do is just do a simple knot underneath the chin, and we're just going to pull it slightly tight, okay? Uh, actually, no, let's do a different way, sorry. So I'm going to bring this over and underneath through that first loop there, and this one is going to come underneath and through that loop there, okay? Now what I want to do is start to apply pressure by pulling these down. So as you pull these, if we can see on the side. Kay, could I ask a little favour? Could you come and hold the... Hold up. Yeah. Okay. What I want to do is have the angles here by pulling this tight, okay? Now, once you've worn this for the first time, you'll be able to do this yourself. But you can see where that's pulling that tight here. So these are your anchor points there and there. And if we come onto the other side, okay, that's the loose piece here, okay? As we pull that tight, that's locking it in and we can just take the slack out there. So what we've got now is one, two, three anchor points. And then this is gonna tie across your chin. Okay. And depending on how much is left, you can just um, loop it around a few times or just tie it at the back here, okay? The other option, if this is quite loose, you just tuck it out here. So this is all about once you've got your own arm, you get this to size, okay? And that would literally stick out there and then you can hide those. But um, personally, if I'm fighting, I'm just going to tie this loosely around the back. But I've got my three anchor points. Now, the thing with the anchor points, once we've put this down, and I haven't completely tied it, okay, that holds it quite tight. But you should be able to move your head around okay. Okay, it's staying quite tight. But if you duck your head, it will pop straight off through the anchor points. I won't do it because of your glasses. So that's the oh, easiest way. Off. Yeah, that's okay. Safety glass. Come okay. on, oh, there you go. Yeah. So you can literally... You'll literally duck your head and you pull your head back and it will pop off. Okay. Nice and easy. And yet, in basswood, you can be moving around quite a lot. Okay. So, in a nutshell, it's those two loops that will do it. Now, there are schools of tying helmets on in the old days and sometimes it was a secret because if I know how you've tied it on and I'm getting in close combat with you, I can learn how to interfere with you and break and cut your helmet off. So quite often they didn't want you to know. There's lots of different ways to do it. But for fighting in, that's the way that I found it, by using these two under your chin, and we're literally gonna pull that one through there and pull it tight on the other one. Now wearing a mempo, it's slightly different. The setup's the same for putting it on. We've got two loops, which are gonna go around your ears. But we put the mempo on first. Now we don't wear the nose when we put it on, that goes on afterwards, okay? 
and we've got a little loop. That's, you don't even need this to be fair, but it's quite handy. This is more for when you're displaying the armour. I just never take it off because it's quite easy just to wear around your neck if you needed to. Okay. Now, the first thing I'm just going to do is make sure it fits first. So it's slightly wide. So I'm just going to bend the ears in a little bit. I won't do it too much because this is Kay, my partner's armour. She don't like it when I mess with it. I'm scared of her. She's a serious samurai. Okay, so I just want to make sure it's basically comfortable there without bending and there's nothing sticking in here, okay? And you'll notice there's two little hooks. These hooks are what's going to hold it in place. So we'll just hook that over there for the moment. We'll leave that hanging down. And then again, we'll pop the helmet on, making sure we've got our two loops. And we've got roughly the same size on each side. Now again, you get it nice and comfortable. And we lift this up into place. Can like hold it? Yeah, you can do it, yeah. Okay, now I've got my cords here. So these are the loops that I've got. That loop there is going to go through the hook and I pull it tight. That hook comes down that loop here and I'm going to pull that tight through there. Okay, and this is what I might do if I'm displaying this in armour. Okay, you can probably let go now. Now you can feel that's probably held that quite tight to your face. It's tight here but it's very loose here, isn't it? So all I'm going to do is to drop these back underneath the first loop just to hold that in place. Again, you're seeing a second loop coming in. I don't like all these tassels, by the way. I'll often take these off. I'll just pop that off there as well. Okay. And I'll just tuck that through the back loop there. And we're just going to tie one. And that's going to lock that into place there. Can you feel how that's now sort of shaped a little bit? I haven't bent it exactly to your face, okay? And now, depending on the length, I can either just tie this across at the back. If I've got a little bit more, I'll come along and tie it at the front as well. This is probably not going to be long enough, but I literally tie that off around the chin area. If I have a little bit more length and it tucks in there. But as I haven't, I'm just going to tie that there. So the loops are holding the mask in place. And underneath your chin, we've got the tie there. And then you can just move it around and get comfortable with it. That's probably digging in a little bit. Is it comfortable, right? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. Let's bend it. Then I'll test my mask, but like I said, the chances are you don't want to be wearing your nose piece, but it literally just clips straight on. One. Yeah, I've got a shadow there, I can't see the light. There we go. That will clip on here and here. I won't put that because that's not um, where I've bent it a little bit. Okay, And that will just sit there. But you can see it's not very comfortable, is it? You can see if someone hits you in the face, can you feel how uncomfortable that would be? But it's very scary looking until you take that off. So this is probably um, choice number two. Personally, I don't normally wear it. Now, if I'm not wearing um, my Mempo, you can also get this neck guard here called an Odawa, which is this part here with a cord or a piece of um, metal, and it just ties around like a necklace. So it, you've got a choice either way. Now, at this stage, we've got the final little piece on, which I'm hoping to find over here. Uh, they made Arte, which is probably in a suitcase somewhere. Oh. There we go. No, the Madate. The, yeah. So basically, you ask what this hook was here. Now, a samurai wants to be recognised, so they would have either a mond or a crest or a deem or a design up here that they would put on here. Now, some of them were made of wood, some of them wasn't. Um, we we'll put it down on the floor. So, oh, there we go. This one will do it. So this is the, the one that we've got here. Okay. Each clan would have a different specific crest or something and that literally hooks on there. Some of them were wooden demon heads, they, some of them were very ornate, but you've got to remember the more ornate it is, the harder it is to wear. Nine out of ten times before the battle starts, the nose comes off and this comes off. Because the first thing, this is not meant to stay on. A lot of them would have used grass and things and uh, lots of... Um, greenery to make them look very bushy and from the wilds and all that kind of stuff, but uh, it was personal choice. Now, other features that you have here, hukeishi, or the, the wings, if you like, at the side. In the old days, these were really big and round, and they were designed to deflect off arrows and, and impacts and things like this, but as things got smaller and as firearms came in, these became a bit of a relic of the past, but they still left them on there. But they do have very useful um, uh, uses as well once we start playing with the weapons in a minute. So what we've got is pretty much good to go, subject to a couple of things. Now, we'll assume that it's um, mid-winter still, or it's not quite summer yet. Um, you don't want to get too hot, but you want to be recognised a lot more in battle. So we now move to two things. One is the choice of sword that you're going to wear, and then the jacket over the top. 
Now, choice of swords, again, you have a wakasashi, um, which can be quite good. If you wanted to now, you can pop that through your belt as a backup weapon. Okay. Again, like I said, you can wear it underneath the armor as well. Um, this is a personal choice, but in, to be fair, it's gonna be absolutely useless to you. So I would say, don't worry about it at the moment. I do see old pictures of samurai with swords coming out of everywhere and across their back, but that's not really accurate of what a samurai would have been. You need to look at it. Um, but what we're gonna wear is the tachi. And this is uh, an example of a touchy. It's much longer than a katana and it's got a much bigger curved on it. Uh, this one's actually a folded one. Let me check it's blunt before I hit you with it. No, we're okay. Okay, and this is pretty much going to be worn um, around the... Are you want me the glasses there or do you need them on? Or? Okay. They'll still go on yet, will they? They will go on. There we go. Now, quite simply, we're going to hang this and I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen once we've got all this done. We're literally going to get that little balance right there. You can see it's pretty much right. And we're just going to put it on the hip, just below the, the dagger here. And if you just want to hold the sword roughly where you're comfortable, it's worn blades down. And all I'm going to do is just pass the two cords around, take it slightly tight. Okay. Now, if we could turn slightly sideways, I'm going to drop the sword a little bit so you can see here. We've got two hanging um, pieces here. I'm literally going to pull that up and through that way. And this one up and through this way and what that's going to do is put reverse tension on it to pull it tight that way which holds it on okay now depending on how much cord you've got I would normally just go around and tie it here or tie it off okay but obviously I've dropped that down a bit so you could see what I did there but we'd wear it up so in this case um, we're just going to tie this off for the moment here okay and there's different methods that you could use to tie this but you want that hanging down roughly about here and any loose bits will knock out of the way but normally I'd tie it over the back here and pretty much that's it other than the jacket and we'll go to um, the Jim Bowery. Now this is very personal preference there's a nice big slit at the back because you've got swords and weapons you want to be using and you want to move around okay and we literally are going to slide one arm through here and this is where these shoulder guards even if you've got the great big ones it does actually fit. We're just going to pull that through here Through here. And you can see now why I didn't do those cords up at the back. And that's just going to sit across. And again, there's a few different designs. Many of the designs have a little um, sort of tape across the front here to hold it in place, but this is meant to be a lot more flowy and loose. And then your shoulder guards are just coming out of the side from here. And obviously, what this means is you're going to be heavily recognised on the battlefield. Um, because of your colourings, there's often you would have your family mons or your clan mons painted on the back as well. Um, obviously I didn't bother with these ones, but uh, quite often you'll see a nice big mon or a pattern on the back that would say who you are. Now you're more of a commander at this stage, okay? so you'd be commanding some soldiers, but if you were a lower rank, um, you would often have a flag at the back as well, which would signify which clan you're fighting for, um, but uh, we haven't looked at that flags today, but it does limit your movement. So now you're pretty much dressed, obviously you've not moved around a lot, but you've got a lot of flexibility and movement in that, which you'll get used to. Moving your head is interesting at the moment, it's a lot better than European armour, but you will eventually get it you know, positioned right, bent to shape so that you can move around a little bit. Do you want me to pop no, in down here? Yeah. Oh, that's alright, yeah. That's probably because of the, the face marks and stuff like that. Okay. So. It's not actually as high as I thought it'd be. No can get quite hot, but it's funny, once you start moving around, your body temperature adjusts to the armour and the vents and everything, and it's amazing how suddenly you're not as hot as you feel. But it's funny, I always get really hot putting it on, and then once we start what, fighting and things, you forget all about it, which is great, the adrenaline kicks in, which is quite good fun. So, at this stage, we're, we're pretty much uh, with the boots on there. He's, he's looking, really, at uh, some of the features on the armour as, as well. Now, obviously the sword itself is always a contention because the sword is the soul of the samurai. That was something that came in the later years of the Edo period uh, when they took up the sword and they weren't soldiers anymore. To be fair, the sword itself wasn't ever meant to be a main battlefield weapon. If you're going up against peasants um, and lowly non-armoured samurai, perfect, you can slash and cut all you like. But the second I come up against a samurai, this armour has been designed to make a sword virtually useless. Um, it's really interesting. Um, so the soul of the samurai is useless. Yeah, well, as in the soul of the samurai, the sword. Yeah, 
democracy in the old days. Um, what you'll see is um, the swords that the uh, samurai used in the battling and warring periods were very basic. They were quite often mass produced, not these fancy things that you see today that take nine months to make. You know, I've got to all organise 20,000 troops and give them a sword. Yeah, they're going to be very basic. Um, many swords at the end of the battle were just thrown away. You couldn't use them anymore. Um, they are ingenious, we're not here to talk about swords today, um, but if you sort of trust me for a second. Yeah, okay. Now, if I'm going to hit you with a sword, you'll notice that these wings are designed that they're actually going to catch the sword here. Okay? And you can actually control my sword a little bit with your head by moving me around. I'm also a little bit open to a, a strike. Cutting in here, and we've actually tried this with actual armour as well, it does not cut through. The armour is designed to be flexible, and that flexibility and movement and all the lace stops that from cutting through and even takes the impact away. If you hold your arm out a little bit, okay, this is designed that it's going to slide off more than cutting. And although that chainmail there, when we did a proper test with a live blade and ch chainmail armour, and I was going for it, I wanted to break that chainmail, the chainmail did break, but it didn't go through the... And obviously, if you're going to stand there and I'm there for 10 minutes, I will probably get through. But on the battlefield, you've only got small movements. If I'm going to come down on your head, and if you turn slightly sideways, okay, everything about this has been designed to stop this from penetrating your body. The armour itself is protecting you. I cannot get through the armour here. Even stabbing is not really great. So if I am going to use a sword, I've got to be very careful with my targeting. So I'd like to look at sort of some of the target areas if I'm using a sword, but that would work with a spear, by looking at the weakness of the arm. Now, weak areas, and we'll start from here. Inside of the arms and under the arms here, there's a gap in the armour here. So these are going to be targets that I want to try for when I'm fighting. Okay. Obviously, the eyes themselves, well, that can be quite a difficult one to do. Now, technically, the inside of the neck... But when you've got all of these cords here, especially if there's chainmail on there, there's not a lot I can do. And some of the shoulder guards that you get have got a, uh, a ridge on them to stop swords from coming in. Now that disappeared later on in the, the time of firearms because you didn't need them anymore. And the chances of you coming up against someone with a sword or whatever, they're more designed to spear, but that will stop that from moving in with a little ridge that you'll see on there as well. But you can see even here it's actually quite hard for me to get into any vital part of the neck even though your carotid artery is right there. It's very difficult. So all the downward blows that I could make with a sword or even upward blows are designed to be caught by the armour. So when I'm fighting often what I want to do is by cut your cords away so part of your armour falls away. Now I know in a fighting style if you've lifted your arm up as if you're going to strike me, okay, I have a perfect position here. So that will be a target area that I want to be coming up with an upward thrust. You'll notice most of the sword has to be thrust. If I come up underneath the armour here, you can see I can come up under the throat area. But again, it's quite a long weapon to be using. The other area of weakness is around the waist here. Although you've got all of this lovely stuff here, there is a gap. So I can thrust in anywhere along here, but slicing this way is very difficult for me to have any action. This is going to have to be a stabbing. A sword is not great for stabbing on the battlefield. It's too hard work, as I found out when we were training. Then we've got the inside of the thighs, here and here, and the backs of the legs, obviously. This side of the thigh, obviously, you've got protection here and protection down here. There's one weak area here on the inside of your shin, which is where the leather is to protect you and the horse. So these are my target areas, and obviously the foot. So the sword, generally, if I'm fighting with a sword, trying to get through here while you're fighting back, and I've got other people around me, is actually quite difficult. So technically, the sword is there for finishing the people off. Uh, if I carried a wakasashi with me, this is more for decapitating, because samurais were headhunters. So the reason that I would have anything like this is more likely that I want to take my heads, um, which is a whole different story again. The most important weapon that you've got is this dagger, um, because as you've probably gathered, stabbing is going to be one of the main key things. Now, especially if we start grappling, you want to make sure that I can't take yours, um, but you can take mine. But I'll borrow one of yours for a minute, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. The second we get in close, this is probably your best friend. From here, once we're in close, you can see how easy it is for me to get into all of these gaps as I'm fighting. And this is the design. This is probably the single most effective weapon in samurai armor fighting, other than my other hands, where I can move in. 
And you'll often find that once we've closed distance, it is all about this kind of stuff, uh, smashing, cutting, and getting in close. So this is probably why more important weapon. You'd probably have another one of these somewhere else as well, stashed on you or in your belt if you needed to, because that's what's going to get you out of trouble when it gets close and personal. So, recording time, how are we doing? Oh man, like uh, 17 minutes. Okay, that's fantastic. So, let's look at some of the main battlefield uh, weapons that we would have seen. Now, we've got to go back to the old days um, a little bit, I'm afraid. So, up until about the 1400s, Archery was the main thing for a samurai to do. Um, every samurai was expected to be trained in archery, uh, and the yari, um, the Japanese yari, is very, very different. Now, I've got a slight bend on this that's broken. It's reversed around, so technically, this, it's going to be this way around. Um, but I've got a little break in the top, so it's, it's popping back. Um, you'll notice that, uh, very different to Western, there's a little bit here and a long bit up here. This was designed on horseback, so I can move it over the horse's neck and take in all angles. It's unique in the world. And also, um, in the West, you shoot from the inside. In Japan, they shoot from the outside. I would be taking my arrows, placing them there, firing, taking the next one, and moving through in a very quick motion. Um, it doesn't take a lot to draw this, because you use your body weight. Okay? Um, Kaiudo, which is a modern style, is very um, zen, very slow, and there's a lot to it. Battlefield archery is totally different. You're wearing full armor quiver and you're on the ground, you're fighting low. I can get really low to the ground and I can still shoot. I can shoot sideways, all different movements. This is a whole art on itself of Japanese archery for battlefield stuff. But uh, you can shoot off arrows left, right and centre. Now the original armour was designed to catch arrows. They could pierce some of the armour and the lacing, um, but not go all the way through. I have shot um, arrows at armour about that much goes through the armour if you're lucky. It's not going to be comfortable having it sticking in you, but it's not going to kill you. And there are lots of woodblock pictures of, they look like por por porcupines with arrows sticking out all over them. So technically, um, in theory, a battlefield would start with an exchange of arrows, horseback charges with arrows, after the arrows were gone they would move into the, the next thing. Slightly romanticised to be fair because a battlefield was nothing like that at all. You had to get in there and it was every man for himself. But there are things that you know, we're looking at the weapon side. Now, many um, archers were taught to have a long spearhead or a dagger that they would stick to the top of the bow. Because at some stage you will run out of arrows, I've now got a spear. And I would then use my bow for stabbing. Um, and fighting as if it was a spear. So that was quite common at that stage. Um, another reason for the shape and design of it as well. Um, although it's quite lightweight, I can still do grappling with this if I need to. So this was quite a multi-purpose tool. Um, when people are charging, um, first thing you aim for, all archers on spearmen, target the horses first, never the samurai. Because you're quite well armoured. If I can get you off a horse, then the horse, especially if it's wounded, will run around with the other cavalry, breaking up uh, all their charge, but also you're on the floor, we can get you much easier once we've got you down. So this was very much around take the horse first. Um, second that, uh, arrows are gone, we turn into spearmen, and I would now use this with spearmen as well. And again, it's quite effective. So archery is one of the first ones. What we saw though, firearms started to come into it, and we saw the decline of, of the archery fighters as well. So again, this is probably one of the main tools up until about the 1500s. The main battlefield weapon for most samurai was the yari, or the spear. And this is a classic design. Now this is quite a fancy one, and I'm going to be honest with you, this is probably no good in battle because it would get stolen. It would be very straightforward. It could be as simple as a piece of bamboo that's had the edge cut off, and you could use that as a spear as well. Now the spearheads generally are very different. They're triangular in shape. I don't know if we can quite see that angle there. Uh, and this is meant to pierce through armour. You, you can bring it closer yeah. to the camera. Now this is well worn. <laughs> I use this for fighting all the time. Um, but the idea was, because I've got the angles at the top, a um, little blood groove down there to break the vacuum, this is designed to split apart pieces of the armour as well. But because it's long, we've got a very sharp blade. Now this is a blunter version for training, but I want to be able to thrust into the gaps and start cutting away your armour. So I can like apply pressure and soar at the same time as coming into the gaps in the armour there. 
Um, the beauty of a spear is it's meant to be used in lots of different ways. Um, if I'm taking this off, you would pop that down your chest to keep that out of the way, so you can pop that back on afterwards to keep it safe. Now, when we train, one of the things, and I, I learned this a long time ago, um, and some of you as martial artists out there, I'm sure, uh, have come across this as well. When we train with weapons, we don't call them weapons. Because if you're training with a weapon, you want to use it. And a weapon isn't always the best thing. It's a bit like when you're using a tool. If a hammer's the best tool for the job, you use it. But if the second that hammer's no good, you need a spanner, change to a spanner. If I'm training with my weapon, I want to use my weapon. Even though we've gotten in close, pulled back, you've grabbed my weapon, you're coming in close, we're getting into daggers now, I want to use my weapon. It's a tool. And a lot of the samurai, um, despite a lot of the myth, believe that these were tools to do the job. This is a great tool, but I can also use the end. And again, we've got, um, you know, quite often we've got nice big weighted um, balls on the end and things like that. Some of these are quite sharp, there's a point. This is for me to target the lower parts of your body, which are not protected. I can obviously use both ends of it by striking in. And again, I want to use it so that your helmet gets knocked to remove your vision and then control you using the shapes of your helmet here. Okay. Although this will stop the helmet uh, strike, it locks me in, but with the extra distance as opposed to a sword, I have some control now. Now you can see why you'd want to take that medarte off. Can you see even now I'm controlling your head? So by removing things like this before the battle, a lot of that control is taken away. So a lot of it is you know, about being fierce to start with and then practically taking away things that are going to make a, a problem for you as well. But again, this has been designed to stop a lot of the blows. But this, at this stage, is a thrusting weapon. And Japanese are trained in the sphere for a lot of strike movements coming down, especially in a line. And the idea is we're just going to beat down on anything that you've got. Now, um, let's say, we'll give you this, this is the Naganata, but let's say we gave you this for a second. Okay. Okay. The shape of the armour, I've got to now decide my target areas. Now, if you just stand just one end there down here, that's fine. But obviously, I know you haven't done this before, I've trained all the time. Now, at the moment, the shape of your hand here, your fingers are totally exposed. Not at the back, though, are they? You see, when you fold your fingers around, they disappear under the armour. So, if you turn your hand over, and hold it that way. Now it looks slightly differently, but you can see now you're slightly better protected where you've got to move it. So when we're losing weapons, I've got to be able to change my grip according to what's going on. So it has to be quite light. Now target areas here at the moment, okay, this is quite armoured. So my target areas need to be more underneath. So I'm going to be targeting to strike up into the weak areas. Once I've got that, I can move into the gaps in the armour once I'm fighting through here. Okay? If I need to, I can come in and strike to control and move and gradually if I need to. We can move into all kinds of throws from here. Obviously we've not pulled together, so I'm going to be <laughs> gentle into the face and what have you. But the spear now becomes a lot more effective than anything else. Again, we've got all different um, skills and training we do with the spears. When we swap over here, this was another common uh, tool for the samurai. Although... Um, there's lots of thought behind who actually used it. So this is a Naganata. The blade here is quite a small one, but we can have quite long blades on here and a long handle. It was said to be a female samurai's tool, and the woman would be expected to trade with a Naganata to protect the home when the samurai's way fighting battles as well. But this is perfect for taking off people on horseback. I can also use a cutting method and keep my distance and grapple with you as well. Um, very common with the Ikoiki or the warrior monks at the time. But there were um, lots of samurai that did love using the Naganata in battle rather than a spear because you've got the best of a, a sword, a dagger, um, but uh, also the long staff. The other thing because of the curve of the blade, it does help me get into some of the gaps by twisting. So I can cut you in lots of different ways and control you with the gaps on here. So you can see how where a spear I may not be able to control necessarily, but you can see how I can move just by twisting my back hand and coming into the gaps that a spear may not be able to come into. Okay? You see where that would go? Whereas a spear it would be a lot different. I can use the control here to control you into different places to open you up. But what I'm trying to do is get under here again and I'm going to be slicing away of the cords to get everything to drop away on the cords of the armour, which is why a good silk jacket helps protect you from a lot of those cuts to stop the cords from coming away. 
Again, a weak area here. This is probably more from a sphere. Okay. But Naganata is using circular cutting movements as opposed to straightforward. Sphere is very thrusting and around. This is more circular when you're fighting as well. So there's a lot of grace for the Naganata, but very, very effective. But overall, they were the main things that you would have been fighting with, other than your, your combat skills as well. So the theory would be, like any fight that you have, we'll start at some kind of distance. Now it could well be that we'll be shooting arrows at each other, whatever it's going to be. Then we come within arm's length where we've got spears or naginatas, and we're at this distance. But somewhere along the line, I'm going to strike myself in, I'm going to come in close enough from here, but now it's hand to hand, because we, these are now pretty much useless. It's now going to be grabbing daggers, stabbing, throwing, getting you on the floor. Once you're on the floor, then we can have some fun. Now this is where it does get interesting, and I, I love this side of history on the summary armour. This is so flexible. You can do backflips in it, rolls in it, back rolls in it, come up standing. With a bit of training, obviously. <laughs> um, it's designed to be very flexible. You can move very, very fast. Now one of the things that you'll hear a lot in the samurai myths is that um, the one-on-one -on -one duel, the battlefield, I'm a warrior, I'm on the battlefield, I only want to fight a worthy warrior that's of my rank and I'm going to give my name and my heritage and I want someone to come and fight me and everyone will leave me alone until the right person comes along. Now, having an ex-soldier, it's never going to happen. Okay? Um, what's interesting is a one-on-one -on -one battle um, wasn't actually one-on-one. -on -one. So if um, I'm one of your retainers and you've got six retainers here, we are your samurai under your name. So you can send us against one person, six against one, and we can bring them down, do a lot of damage to them, kill them, or you can come and do the final one and take their head. But you beat him one on one, because we're fighting under your name. So a lot of the training we do is not based on one on one combat that you see from the movie romantic side of the samurai. It is down and dirty, and whatever odds take. So you've got to be able to move very easily in this armour and keep into account it's going to be multiple attackers, which is where the weaponry and the training comes in and the flexibility has to come in there. Once you know the weaknesses of your armour, you can then fight accordingly. And that's something I've really enjoyed, is the philosophy of being able to fight around armour that um, is going to be um, open in certain areas. So I'm going to try and make you open up where I can. So as an example, let's say that we... Can you resist that? Yeah, no, we'll, do. we'll just demonstrate for the moment. Obviously, maybe another time I've got, we can I've come got, back to I've got safer fight. weapons if you want. Yeah, no, this is fine. This, this is... Um, a, okay, a yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll organise another system. Yeah. I'm sure Reddit will love yeah. to have you back. Now, obviously, we're a bit closer together than normal for the camera, but let's say I need to open up. The way that you've covered yourself there, you know, you're, you're quite nicely covered in most areas, okay? I can't really get through to much at this stage, okay? But I know where your weakness is area. So if I suddenly draw up like that and your attention is going up and you start to raise, which is a natural reaction, you may want to carry me so you'll lift your spear up potentially to stop that. But what you've actually done is opened yourself up now. So I hit you underneath, I've now got an opening that I can hopefully come in to take that weakness into account. Going down and thrusting up under here could be another one. Now I'm down here, I can come in behind the leg here and the leg here. So this is the theory of fighting, is that I want to be able to explore the gaps. And as samurai were quite proud of their martial skills. And you wanted to be good and show that you were good on the battlefield. And they did train, they were probably one of the most disciplined fighters the world's ever seen for their time. And very tenacious, they weren't going to give up either. And we're talking most of the samurai, of course many of them weren't like that. You know, the lower ranks and everything else, they weren't really, didn't even want to be there in the first place. But we're talking about the real samurai here that would have worn this kind of armour. So a lot of it was about the display of skill, but at the end of the day, we get in close and we've got to now look at all the different areas to be aware of. So we've got some of the weak areas, but when we're in grappling, we've got to be aware of other areas as well. And this is where wearing the armour is quite important and how you tie it. Now, one of the areas that I've got is some great grip around here, okay? I can manoeuvre your body in close up here very quickly. It's a great handhold, okay? which is why some of these cords are very light. If necessary, if I pull hard enough and I'm grappling, I need that to be able to break so that it stops me from being able to throw you around. Um, other areas as well on the helmet, as you can see, we've already talked about the helmet. I can actually grasp and use these. But again, you've seen how earlier on you can duck your head and come straight out from underneath it and then hold the helmet and hit me in the face with it. So it's quite common to see battlefield stuff 
where you literally slip your head out of the helmet and now you're bashing away, especially when you've got one of the conical ones that's made out of steel. Okay, so this is really getting down and dirty, which is why the knots and everything are very important. Again, you've got to be thinking about the face. You're quite well protected here, but in the nose piece, one hit to the face and you're not going to be able to function very well. Um, so these are the things we look at. Um, obviously, grappling is very important in Japanese con um, history and culture. It's the bending and the twisting of the limbs. So I want to be able to utilise when I get in close to open you up. Again, where you can see with the dagger, that I can open you up and get into these gaps as well. So the flexibility that you need to do is countering. So you need to almost be able to do jujitsu in that full set of armour. Now, if you're wearing the old European armour, the big knight and you can hardly move, jujitsu is probably not going to be the best way. Oh, trust me, some of them I've seen are really good, by the way. But it takes years of training, a lot of skill. But here, again, it's a different culture and a different time. Being able to move quickly and easily, which is where this is designed. Obviously, you can see your legs can move very easily. You're not restricted in any way. Nice long start if you need to. You can move, you can run, you can jump, kick, um, which is great. Interesting, a lot of the samurai, you don't want to be kicking any higher than there. Because when you're wearing armour, you're going to find it's very top heavy and you're going to be falling over. So there's none of these kicks that you'll see in the movies. A lot of it is just to break the knees to get in close and move around. But you'll be able to do that very easily in the armour uh, at the same time. But, uh, Obviously you've had a little go, jump up and down a bit, see how it feels. Very flexible, isn't it? It's all moving with you. It does actually push back on me. It will do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and the padding underneath, you can see where that would have come in with that belt, you, you know, if it's in the right place. But again, what you'll find, once you've worn this while, you'll bend it to shape your body. You'll find out where all the gaps are, and you'll be like, right, let's bend that into shape, which is very important. Whenever you get armour, you make it fit by bending it as well. Um, but the sleeves look all right. I, I would suggest we've probably got a little bit of a gap here that we want to, to close in, but that's fine. And we'll bend it in a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Well, any questions that we're open to while we... Oh, no. Like, uh, I think uh, people are starting to, like, file out now. Mm -hmm. So um, we have, like, roughly 400 people asking. They're, they're just enraptured. So oh, yeah. keep going, if you like. Yeah. Otherwise, um, we do have nine minutes left. So okay. if we well, could continue we for, like, right? another... Yeah. Four minutes, and then yeah. we could do another plug, and then Absolutely. see if um, we want to do another hour. We briefly or not. spoke about gloves earlier on. Um, I'm not a, a fan of gloves, but that's just me. Um, a lot of people do, but very thin gloves. They quite often have a deer skin. Um, to be fair, this is a, a sort of a, a cotton fabric that I prefer um, over that, which is a, a fancy pair of gardening gloves that fit very tightly. Um, they quite often would wear them underneath, but these were more for the commanders. Um, and I'm having done a few um, sort of movies where I've had to play parts behind the armour, if it is a slightly cold day and you're the commander, you're not doing a lot of moving around. Your fingers get very cold, the metal on it, and, and, and you can actually lose the feeling of your fingers. If you're the one doing all the fighting, the gloves get in the way, but you don't have the problem of being cold. So the idea is to be able to get them on and off. It should be loose enough that you should just be able to slide your fingers which if I've done this right, they'll just pop straight out with a little bit of help, okay? And you can now relax, take that off if you wanted to eat, if need be, but then you can pop your gloves on and off and see what, you know, if you feel the difference by putting the right on the hand, what the difference with the glove is. Um, but again, you've got the ability of grip, but um, I like mine to be very thin because I do like to feel, you know, the weapons that I'm using and all that kind of stuff. But it does change it slightly, but I can promise you, once the heat starts setting, I don't know if that will still go in there, but I don't want to break your fingers. Yeah. If not, do the thumb. But uh, once the heat starts getting in, these can be very, very um, uncomfortable for me. But again, that's a personal preference. Some people I know love them and wear them all the time. But uh, that does um, make a few differences in the sizing and things like that. But what you'll find is that uh, you'll have less cuts and nicks and everything like that. So that's a little bit more of a, you know, during the winter period. But during the summer, there's no way. You'll probably find during the heat of the battle as it goes, you'll be dropping bits of armour. So the first thing to go is normally the thigh guards drop it. It's heavy, it will start getting loose, it will start to drop around your waist a little bit sometimes, um, which is just normal movement. Um, if you haven't got anyone to tie it up, you're better off just undoing it, which is why you need to be have access to the knot. So if we'd have tied it around the back, you've got no chance with everything else we've got tied at the back there. But actually, your knot here is right through that little gap there, which is that little gap in here. So you can undo that and drop that very easily as well. So I'm always careful when I'm tying the knots, can I get to those knots? That's why I like them in certain places, just along the front part, I can lift up. I've got to come round the back with everything on, you'll find it's very, very difficult to actually get things removed. Um, 
which is why yeah. little things that I've learned over the years of wearing it and thinking, well, as a soldier, what's practical here in the thing? Another thing that has been found on some of the armour, on the inside here, um, there's um, scrapes of Japanese writing. And people have gone, oh, that's the, the name of the smith that made it. And the um, Actually, when you translate it, it's actually shopping lists. It's things that they want to remind themselves. It's like their diary, where they've been, who they've killed, or more importantly, things I need to pick up. So uh, there was one that said, um, oh, I need a new um, set of sleeves and a new medate um, to go onto my helmet, what have you. And it was a reminder on the battlefield to be picking things up. But quite often, these are things that you want to write to remember um, for things for later, especially as a headhunter, um, that you needed to be able to um, yeah, get your heads off the battlefields in a safe place, come back. But you normally had servants do that in many cases. But of course, they, you know, anyone stealing a head and claiming a head, it, it got quite contentious later. Very gruesomely, which is where the, the mask comes in, um, they had a lot of problems in later years of samurai leaving the battlefield to take their heads and put them in a safe place so they didn't get stolen. And it was very hard to command them. So the commander said, instead of a head, we'll accept a nose. So you could cut a nose off. But the downside to that, which is where the dagger comes in, um, the nose itself, um, they realised very quickly that the local female population declined very rapidly because they're just going to town and cut ladies' noses off. So what they said then, I want the nose and the lip so that they could see that there was a moustache there as well, so that it was a man's nose, not a woman's nose. So that's uh, one of the nasty sort of habits of the samurai um, that we used to see as well. Um, but the decapitation in helmet, if I could take your head in that helmet, that's a great thing. So there is techniques that they used to train to get you on the ground and come up underneath here, be able to do a side slit across and then you're face down and you're behind and you can lift the head and the helmet away. So there was techniques that they had to play to do that, which is why some of these knots were designed to prevent that from happening as well. And that's why chain through that. So Reddit asks, NPC County Reeves, are you okay? You've been wearing that for two hours now. There you go. How, how much does it weigh? Like, is, does it feel good? Yeah, it feels pretty good. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not hot at all, but it might be because it's cold at night. My feet are a little bit tired because the weight is all there. Mm. I'm not actually feeling it on my back much at all. Mm. Okay. Of course, you're standing in one position probably as well, whereas normally you'd be moving around a little bit more. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, um, they also want to know if um, if it's hard to do like katana cuts, and they want to see him in full armor do do a few cuts. So maybe maybe show him a few basics. Yeah. Have you used one before at all? No. no. Well, interesting in armor, there's a slight few variations. So as an example, I'm not wearing armor at the moment. If I'm in full armor, and especially I've got the flag on the back, and I've got a great big medati up here, I can't actually get my hands up much further because the flag at the back and the horns on my helmet. So a lot of the movements are going to be off to the side now. So these movements here, and all of these are designed that you can quite happily cut with a sword. So if you just hold that, and it's like you're shaking hands with the front hand, that's it, and then shaking hands with the back, and you're going to have a little gap, it's not a sword, that's a bit, a little bit of a gap there, so you've got a bit of flexibility, okay? Back hand is the power, front hand is what you aim, push, and pull is the idea. So the idea is, can you get your arms up and be able to slash down? Very easily. That movement is there. I'll get out of your way, it's fine. So there's plenty of movement, and if you went from side to side, you can move in very easily. And the same, you can go from the ground and come upwards if you needed to. That flexibility is there. I feel like edge alignment is terrible. Mm. Comes with practice. That's it. Cool. That's all there. There's lots and lots of free movement there. Obviously, putting a sword away face down on the battlefield in there is, is quite fun as well. But I'll help you out on that one for the moment. <laughs> but there's constant. You've got to be re-evaluating because you'll find things will start slipping down. Now, this was a quick, not just because uh, right. the time. All right. Um, we're running. We're running low on time, so it's we've got two minutes left. So we've got to quickly yeah. do our plug. Yeah, plug. Right. So, uh, yeah, where, where are the kids? They find you. What's your name? All right, so it's what Mike Graham. I, I train in a club called Muso Shugyu Ryu, uh, which uh, we work via Facebook at the moment as well. And we've got uh, classes in the UK as well as um, in Australia here, which we started up. And I've been training for about 40 odd years. Um, and I do have access, uh, if anyone's interested in buying armor, although making it is a lot more satisfying, 
Um, let me know because again, although I'm not running the UK retailer, I still have access to getting armour at uh, a decent price for you as well. So talk to me about what you need and we see what we can do. But um, I've been training for 40 years. I love it. I'm as passionate now as the day that I started. I'm fascinated with the armour and the practicality of it and training in it. So uh, I'm more than happy. Hopefully I'll be invited back to do some more stuff on armour at uh, a later date. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think Reddit has quite enjoyed it. And of course, um, uh, of course you can get I think this armor that we've been showing here is an iron armory armor. Yes, that's one of the, uh, so one of the early models. Live links, yeah. live links up. Yeah. I'll DM me and I'll hook you up. Mm. Um, so iron you can buy mountain. this. Iron Mountain, yeah. Iron, iron, mountain. iron, mountain. iron, mountain. iron mountain Armory. Yep. Or Guardians of Old Australia or something, something associated. Live links. And uh, if you like what we do as a stream, make sure you upvote and uh, follow using this button right here. And uh, also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel uh, the link is right up here. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Upvote, follow, subscribe, and we'll see you. I think we will we'll think about, well, I think we will might go for another hour, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll restart the stream, see how we feel. Um, but it's, we're, we're wrapping it up here, basically. But we'll have more, so stay tuned. Cool. cool. <laughs> not that much in my arm. Is it finished? So you, you can probably find that even there. Excuse me. Yeah. Hmm? Is it finished? It's quite uh, uh, you can see. Well the the yeah, second the second Reddit broadcast yeah. finished. We finally yeah. finished the first one, yeah, so yeah. people were expecting well, uh, for me it's the new so one. So finally right now. Um right. Uh, the YouTube's still going. Yeah, 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 so this is just downtime. We haven't really restarted Reddit yet. YouTube is still going, so YouTube is still up live. Are you going to be famous on YouTube? There you go. <laughs> Maybe. That's 10 seconds of a, 0.5 seconds of fame. Your claim to fame. <laughs> Daddy, look, look at this. One very yeah, small. Yeah, I've got a quick plug. Plug, okay. <laughs> oh, that's very informative. It's great. So you all kitted up. No, 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 no. Oh, this is, um, this is Alan. Yeah, yeah, so that's the soft stuff if you guys wanted to go into strikes. But it, I think I think so far we've done quite a bit and I'm quite happy with our results so far with our first stream. Obviously, you want to take some pictures in this. <laughs> Do you not? Yeah, I was going to grab them off the <laughs> Oh, okay, but we can take, we take photos if you want. Um, we just need a good light because we've got to get that light somehow in front of you because this is costing Can you show me? Um, yeah, so we can do that. Um, as for as for the stream, it's uh, I'm I'm quite happy to finish up. Um, You got a hundred and thousand unique views, and you hit max like the max peak was five and a half thousand people watching. Yeah. So that's just people like scrolling through. So how many people saw it? But we had like five thousand people watching. Wait, just like on and off. All over the world. Oh, uh, Reddit is all over the world. So do you want to take the? I'm taking the armor off. Huh? Might well, just reverse with really, isn't it? So do you want it of, of taking the armor off or? No, it's good. Like uh, I think I think putting it on was the thing. Did you want to take photos before you take it all off, oh, yeah, there, James? Or do you have a phone? Oh, yeah. You can take some pictures. I'm used to wearing this. I don't think. Yeah. Can I just grab them off the table? Yeah. One of 
there's, there's a camera here. Do you want to pick up a weapon and pose? Oh, yeah, you know. That's a good background. <laughs> you don't really have much. That's probably a lot heavier, bulkier than that one there, but uh, that's actually a really nice looking arm, too. Good. All right. Mm -hmm. I'll send them to you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks everybody for watching. Um, it is getting late, and we all have work tomorrow, so we'll end the stream here. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you like what we do, uh, make sure you like, follow, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Um, and we'll see you again next week. It, it's uh, this. This was a bit of a uh, special stream. Um, it's unclear whether whether we have a regular schedule for this we don't have it yet we just wanted to try this out and see how it went went pretty well so um it will uh i will definitely plan something else we'll definitely plan another one so uh keep an eye out for that in the meantime we'll see you next time thanks for joining us we're going to sign off here and we'll take it easy